a date with my lady friend. Oh, well, look at you. And just as we go live, wow, the phone chat, call. <laughs> well, the, well, it's just, you know, <laughs> considering that you're like imprisoned in your own post national country. Yeah, I know, eh? It's uh, amazing. But we are <laughs> we are live, aren't we, ladies and gents? Oh, two, three. Um, uh, yeah, man. That's uh. So, so, what what did I want to start off with? Um. Yeah, oh, good. Well, it is working to Twitter, by the way. So we're. Oh wow! Oh my we're, god! We're we're stream yards is making it work. Yeah, let me go read. Well, I mean, they can see it on my Twitter yeah, account. Yeah, so there yeah, we go. Yeah. I'm just. Uh... Um, <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, this well, last week uh, might as well explain sure uh, what happened um we tried to re- pre-record because prude uh matt i, and, I went uh, on a, I went on a trip and yeah. uh, we tried to pre-record on wednesday with default friend and my internet took an absolute dump on me so yeah. uh very angry that i couldn't get anything out for you all but we're back um you know how, how what's the meme go we're so back so, so. yeah it's over we're so we're back we're it's, so it's back. the never-ending cycle um yes yes um uh so Man, yeah um well, well we with, will have maybe next week we could have default or maybe the week out because we wanted to talk to her about some uh movies. some very deeply personal movies for you G. <laughs> i know yeah well if you include heavy in that one the one from 95 with i saw you post Ty- about it and then yeah, i read yeah. it and i was like oh god <laughs> but i had a tweet today i had a tweet today but i had two tweets one was about ireland having these no prayer zones which is abominable and, and you know what's funny is that they have the names of saints, like Saint, like Lourdes Hospital, Saint Teresa Hospital, but there's no prayer zone yeah. to prevent to prevent protesters. For God forbid you protest that one medical yeah, procedure. Yeah, um, God forbid. Um, but I mean, I, it really does show kind of uh, how quickly things with Ireland had changed from being one of the most like conservatively Catholic countries in America to all yeah. this. It's, it's, well, you know what's funny is that um, someone posting the replies about how if you compare it to the silent revolution in quebec mm-hmm. the quiet i think it's silent or quiet i forget i um I, it's either one of the two either um, way it wasn't loud yeah well yeah yeah <laughs> like like if you do compare them they have the same sort of dynamic in that something other than the faith was holding them to catholicism in this case the hatred of the anglos after that is gone then, you know, after the the Accords and after Sinn Féin went from a very, like, working class Marxist party, kind of like Labour was back in the 70s and 80s, to, like, this, you know, progressive socialist, blah, blah, blah. Like, after that, then they had no reason, then the faith was pretty much done for. And, and of course, like, not denying that the Catholic Church did do some bad things in Ireland, not denying that, obviously. But I think, like, the dramatic turn into the parallels are amazing. So that was one tweet. The other tweet that really blew up that I had to mute just because, you know, it's clogging my phone up was about the monarch butterflies. There's this woman in London, Ontario, who for 20 years cultivated specifically an ungardening thing on her property, her private property, where she would uh, put like uh, hyacinths and um, honeysuckles and, uh, other varieties that would attract monarch butterflies and it became like a rest stop for them when they migrate. So what are they like? She goes on vacation and all her neighbors are cool with them. So it's probably a new neighbor. They reported her and the, the city sent the, the bylaw people with weed whackers and totally. Yeah, I've, I've got the tweet up here. We yeah, go. yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. And, uh, it's infuriating. Cause I, I, my personally, people who know who have been following me for a long time, I've dealt with the city Jannies, okay? My family has. Um, long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, my father, uh, he w- used to park for almost 30 years. He parked his equipment on our um, front driveway. We have a large driveway. And uh, like large, like not like lengthwise, but like widthwise, right? Um, and we had the psycho neighbor I can almost guarantee you that because he was trapping cats, this neighbor killed my first cat, Boots, trapped him. Never, Because Boots would never leave us. Just disappeared one day. And this guy was trapping cats. And uh, thank God he moved out a few years ago. And, uh, you know, he used, he weaponized these board bylaw officers with an over-budgeted over board bylaw officers against us. And they would harass us. They'd take photos of our yard at nighttime. It was terrible. And then we had to go to court. It was It was... 
Bylaws, listen, I'm not going to fed post, ladies and gentlemen. Bylaws, bylaw officers, scum of the earth, in my opinion. Um, all, all cops are bad. No, no, all bylaw people are. Never mind, never mind. I'm yeah, all, 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 all code enforcements are, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's really despicable, right? Like, I mean, I understand if we were harassing people, but we tried to keep it copacetic, you know? I mean, no, no other neighbor complained for like 30 years. So, um, anyways, how was your week? You had a busy week, uh, you had a busy week, Matt. You were on, uh, you know, Oren's uh, show, and uh, you talked. I you had another. Um, I so yeah, no, I, yeah, I've been busy. Yeah, I was on. I to, to we'll just do the shilling up front, right? So I was on Oren McIntyre's yeah. stream. We talked about uh, uh, the polit our political opposition being criminalized, but then we just we had a much more long, larger conversation about managerialism in a globalized society where we're now dealing with like foreign interests in, involved and how that applies to say real estate or, you know, it was a very good conversation. Um, I also recorded with this, uh, this uh, not interesting uh, DeSantis guy who we were talking about um, just, uh, you know, what about just rank punditry, about whether or not he decides to run um, what good he can do in the state of Florida. Yeah. Um, Cause he's very pro DeSantis. And I, I, I think that it, you know, Ron should keep Florida a free state. He's better in Florida. Yeah. 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 That, that's my position is that. Yeah. yeah. So we had a, a long conversation about that. That'll come out later. His, um, his name is a, a can of tea. Uh, he's got a little channel with a profile picture of just like him as an Arizona iced tea can, which is just <laughs> like uh, peak aesthetics. I love it so much. And then yeah, it's um, part of the vapor wave that and Fiji water. That's yeah. Part of the vapor yeah. wave, you know. So, <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I I was out last weekend. Um, I I won't go too much into details of it. For those of you who are in the know, you you definitely uh, are already yeah. know. But yeah, I was uh, seeing a, a lady friend, so I'll leave it at that. Nice. Um, and uh, on this week, I have a special episode. I didn't have content minded this week because yeah. next week I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna just absolutely go all guns and blazes. It's gonna be. A, I did three hours with Default and Helena, and Helena Ooh. stayed for an extra hour. So that'll be on Patreon, though, because that got a bit of spicy, you know. But uh, anyways, uh, and then also Default said it, she was kind of pissed that night mm -hmm. over, like, people trolling her. So she just, like, went off, right? We, she went off. Um, and <laughs> so this week I have a special um, episode of Style Talks with me and Matthews. Me and Matthew the Stout. And we did five I, – I, I, I kid you not – almost five hours covering – the band Fear Factory's album, Obsolete. And so the first episode's already up. So I see you, Aaron, in the chat. I see you, Ace. Um, next episode drops tomorrow, and then the final third part will drop... Um, no, wait. The other two parts will drop Monday and Wednesday. And I have a Patreon uh, extra part where, like, me and... Like, stuff that was good, but me and Matthew felt were not as comprehensive. Like, we... First of all, like, what, I did this, like, huge rant because um, they... Uh, Fear Factory has this one song called No Exit about the uh, assistant, um, how should I say this for YouTube? Assistant sunsetting, assistant checking out organization in Europe. Yeah. No Exit, right? So they have this song about it, right? Like total lib crap, right? So I just like hammer, I just like really go, <laughs> go off on it. And so that one, uh, we started dissing Opeth for a little bit. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, so that was well, my week and uh, well, good yeah. sounds like you've been awfully busy uh but i mean i think yeah. that's actually a good segue into sort of the things that um our guest of honor will be on uh in about an hour like yeah. i mentioned in the chat before we went well, live i wanted to ask you Prue, did, yeah. you, uh, did you read the latest med gold article no i i, I have L not listen, i listen. saw do I saw... you want total fuck no i'm kidding, I'm kidding. Do you want... um i i kind of agree more so You're with, with your uh, lady friend prude so i don't know if you should read that it'll inspire you maybe you well know? i i'm more with enoch powell's position on twitter the mod oh, the okay. urbanite were you know trying to increase <laughs> yeah. the the fuck rate without you know being degenerate so I, that, listen Med, <laughs> listen he's a friend of mine i know he gets a lot i don't agree with everything he says obviously he gets in a lot of heat i think he does it on purpose I've never seen anyone, any poster ever get like per, like say per capita is per tweet, right? Yeah. Per tweet, get the amount of death threats that he gets per tweet. <laughs> Apparently, Bleep Sama has upped the ante to a thousand dollars on Discord. If someone can, 
locate Med Gold. So I'm not even joking. Well, I, oh, I, I sincerely hope Med Gold lives up to his uh, sort of his profile and his personality yeah. then when they do get him. But um, no, I mean, when, I love what you said when they do. Get well, him. they do. I'm sorry. All of this is inevitable. Like how you have Very like true. Antifa Jannies like trying to like always follow after you. I mean, I just think that it's an inevitability. So you either get ahead of the game or you don't end up like, you know, just don't fake it um, in that regard. Right. That, that was that reminds me of this one scene in The Sopranos where Tony and <laughs> Tony and, and uh, Johnny Sack, the the, the consigliere of New York. They're playing, and, and he just had his um, top guy who was Phil Leotardo's brother just got whacked, but he was whacked by Tony B, Tony, you know, Tony Soprano's cousin. Um, what's his name? Uh, oh, I can't believe I forgot his name. The very famous actor. Um, you know, he was in, uh, he was Donnie and Big Lebowski. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Oh God. What's his name? Uh, the googly eyes, you know, I can't really forget his name, but there's a scene where they're playing golf and uh, they're talking about Joe Peeps who just got whacked, and uh, they're like, Yeah, Steve Buscemi, Steve Buscemi, you and uh, you know, and Johnny Johnny Sack was going on about how he loved this kid and he was my driver, and then Tony goes, uh, Yeah, you know, it's it's sad when they go, and Johnny looks up, When they go. <laughs> Like meaning, like wait, like he didn't die a natural death. You know? yeah. When they go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve Buscemi. Uh, no, but it's like with the way you said it, like well, or when they get mad, you know, when well, they get mad, go. <laughs> uh, they 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 come for us all. Uh, yeah, they so come. For <laughs> they, they come for yeah. us all. Eventually, it'll it'll happen to both of us, right? But um. There you I did. Yeah. I did it to myself. There you go. Um, <laughs> but, but anyways, no, I thought that that w the the music talk was probably a good segue though into oh. sort of the subject of our conversation, the vibe shift, because I think that um, as the millennials can uh, continue to age, um, we're not yeah. these age. We're not an ageless generation out of time as much as the media likes to to say that we keep killing industries. I mean, there's a whole other generation of kids now that are getting older. Um, I, I thought it was interesting because, like, as our as our guest will probably be so happy to elaborate, <laughs> right? Because he's been talking about art and vibe shifts for like yeah. three yeah. streams now. But um, what uh, I thought was really interesting is that he was just talking about, and he didn't. I don't. He didn't reference negative XP, but the distributors had mentioned um, the whole, you know, Scott Pilgrim versus the world and ruining a whole generation of women, um, yeah. which true, that moment, right? man, that when that came out, when when shooter came out with that oh my that was that, but there's a I, yeah. the whole like 2010s hipsterdom like michael Cera era where he had like um what was it like he had some sort of like youth and revolt where he came up with a more masculine french alter ego to get with a girl and we had yeah. scott pilgrim versus the world that was super bad right like there's just a laundry list of of that kind of stuff and i think that really kind of helped define sort of a lot of like the older and uh, younger millennials uh, um, in, in that regard, I think. And now that we're getting older, um, I think that we're sort of watching the cultural moment shift away maybe from, uh, I mean, we're still seeing the consequences of that, right? But I think we're also getting to a point where uh, Zoomers are going to have their own really big cultural moment. And mm -hmm. maybe it's mm -hmm. not film, but maybe perhaps it's it doesn't have to be. Maybe it's more algorithmically inclined where, you know, like the TikTok algorithm ruined a whole generation of women or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that there's a lot that goes into it. But I mean, it, it, it built off of, um, I remember, what, what was it, the other episode we did where Charlemagne was just basically like, Zoomers have no cultural memory, sorry kids. <laughs> and I and I think to kind of a point to maybe like steel man his thesis or he's just, um, you know, consider the fact that there is still a bunch of like dyed blue hair kind of like Ramona Flowers type characters that are just like 18, 19, 20, you know, clearly Gen Z. And, um, and you know, and it, 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 to me, it just kind of shows that, oh, the, the vibe has shifted. The focus now is going to be on um are, are zoomers going in the same direction um or are they yeah. heading down something far far worse yeah yeah well i, I liked there was this one point and i think um it'll be interesting because there's a few points i wanted to sort of uh nail dave down on a little bit mm. um especially his other video this other video he did a while ago but i think it was a great uh live stream there's this one point he he said something very interesting he said that He's like, I, I went out. I can't do the I can't do the distributor's voice. I can't. Do I can't it. either. Um, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. 
I went out the I went out to the theater. I swear, I saw the movie. I went out to the theater, and for the next ten years, I've been wrestling with Ramona. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. It's like so true, King. Like it's th- because I feel like um, as the Milena Lol woman, <laughs> like uh, I think like he said he hit the nail on the head, and like this December, I'm also turning thirty, and uh, it's when the millennial um, woman reaches thirty. I I feel like uh, it's going to be quite interesting. Because they will still, like Dave alluded to this, there will still be um, the air of like attractiveness to an extent. Of course, that goes down because of uh, the chemicals in the food and water uh, and other other reasons. And um, I feel like I look at Zoomer women, I feel like they're extremes. Like they're more extreme than anything in terms of just their pure body aesthetic. I think the chemicals and the bisphenols and the corn seed oils and something about them they look kind of the kids are all right yeah they look either super skinny or they have like very rounded features very like uh i don't know what you would call it um they have something there's something about the zoomer woman that kind of looks like i don't know i don't know i don't know maybe it's because i'm a millennial but then so I feel that the vibe shift, like, first of all, I, I kind of don't like the term vibe like that. It's a meme. <laughs> it's another black Twitter meme vibe I, shift. Vibe but, shift um, or the energy in the room is shifted or something like yeah, that. You yeah, know, yeah. there's, there's definitely a lot of them there. I, for Look me, at I Cyber just. Cyber Ninja Zero. They have Geo. <laughs> 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 oh my God. I could, uh, never, I could never talk. I've been burned too many times on Twitter. By talking about physiognomy, I try to refrain from it, but it's just, <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, no, um, I know they have the moon face, right? That's yeah, like me. They they, um, they have they have the the moon face. Yeah, no, there's yeah. but I mean men men Listen, I think Zoomer men have my, the same problem. Yeah, if you saw photos of me from 2018, I look terrible. I gotta admit, I'm I, I'm starting to look a little bit. I'm, my facial features are starting to come in a little bit, but uh. Zoomer girl, what is TB88? Zoomer oh, he says Zoomer girls like, want to look like babies, artificial neoteny. Well, I, um, some of them, some of them, some, yes, yes. Yeah. I think the the neoteny aspect, because now it's no longer, um, I think the cultural air that they're breathing is more attuned to the internet. So it's not like millennial women where you had to be kind of, I don't want to insult anyone. I don't want to insult them, but you got to be kind of a little special to like be into anime and to be into things that are typical of the male gaze. So, but Zoomer girls, they know about anime. They know about uh, Evangelion and they, Asuka. They know about, uh, you know, what's the, what's the woman one? Fujoshi's? Is that the one? I one? could not tell you. You're talking yeah. to the wrong, you're talking to the wrong guy. Um, but, I, but they I grew about, up with it. Yeah. Yeah. They know about cosplaying. They know about, things that are typical of uh, the autiste of the internet. So yeah. the style of the Zoomer woman is this weird post-Tumblr amalgamation of these different influences. Whereas Normie, like, you know, Normie, like especially white millennial women that still wear Uggs and still listen to, uh, what do they listen to? I, I don't even know. Uh, you know, the sort of like yoga pants, Ed Sheehan listening to, artificial bottle blonde uh millennial white woman it's it's Mu- totally when they when, when mumford and sons was still uh yeah. okay before yeah. the jordan peterson yeah. bit and the ones who were into esoteric more male dominated things they had a, a few uh put it this way they're they're moderating a few discord uh servers so yeah that's i'll say no more um and it's it's funny because um a lot of people say that the gen xers they either get a pass or they either maybe contributed to the rot or they're sort of like neglected, even though the cultural forms of the Gen Xer was um, very key to the millennial attitude. And I think, well, Dave will talk about this. Yeah. Panic yeah. at the disco, my chemical rum. Yeah. But I don't think like as the millennial woman approaches 30, that they're still listening to my chemical. Maybe they could listen to it. I think I, to, to be honest though, I think that's more of a male thing. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I, when you and I are both seeing 30 on the horizon, you a little closer than me. Um, 
But uh, I, I find it interesting because a lot of my favorite bands were like your very basic shit lib millennial, you know, <laughs> bands that I still listen to unironically because I think the music is still really good. Yeah, if you're um, Canadian, you were listening to like Protest the Hero. That was like, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. Uh, Protest the Hero, um, like, uh, or, or someone probably had 16 Military Wives by the Decemberists on repeat, right? Yeah, um, yeah, th th yeah. That sort of music is stuff that I still like. I, I unironically I appreciate and enjoy it despite the fact I know it's, it's it's shit livery. Like I know that John Darnielle is like some really skinny hick lib that loves unions in the Midwest, but oh, I can't help but deny that he's got a good voice for the mountain goats, right? Like Weren't it's they things... on the Colbert Report, or the December. They were on the Colbert. Uh, Report. The uh, yeah. They've been on the Colbert Report. So the mountain goats. I mean, um, and now they're on the the whatever late show that Stephen yeah. Colbert hosts. It's just like it's almost as if, and this is something that, um, and again, right? Because we're <laughs> referencing our guest of honor. Um, uh, you know, that when Dave had the um, Sargon on, he had Carl Benjamin on. Uh, mm -hmm. they, he, Carl made an excellent point that a lot of like Western millennial post 1990s like mindset has been that a lot of these like Western people um, do kind of buy into the end of history thing where they are beings outside of time. Yeah. And so like you notice this a lot when it comes to especially over the last two years, right? With like Stephen Colbert now having a late night show and it's still acting like it's 2009 all over again. Like Obama just got into office and things are OK. And it's like these reactionary evil, like, you know, middle of the country, red, you know, America, you know, cons need to like they've been go. beaten back. Yeah, yeah, they've been beaten back. They well, think but, like they point out that's not true anymore. That's not. Yeah, true. but they act like it is, though. That's the thing is that the behavior has not, um, <laughs> you know, gotten past that that mindset, despite the fact that things are, have changed and things are getting older. And I think that, yeah, there's going to be a lot of mental health issues as, you know, a lot of millennials get to 30 and 40. But I do think what I've seen a lot of, and I think this kind of partially explains the more widespread prevalence of uh, certain, well, they banned the word on Twitter uh, or no, on, on Reddit. So I guess we'll just use predator instead. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, their, their predation on, on, on childhood, I think, really does come in two areas. One, death of innocence, as we've yes. talked about before. But then secondly, they're sublimating the fact that they don't have kids themselves. And so yeah. what do you do? You infiltrate the area where children are around, you get involved, and you put your own cultural uh, taste on things and try to expand upon it. Because like, what, what wrecked millennials on social media? I think Tumblr has a great deal of uh, issue with that in the same way that maybe the blogosphere and early YouTube did the same. And now, yeah. like, here we are. Yeah, uh, who who is in the chat that said, um, where is it? Where is it? Um, <laughs> someone met Ross Boss Dream Theater. Listen, here's here's the tip. Okay, mm -hmm. you find a woman in the wild who is younger that listens to Dream Theater. Either one, you marry her, or B, you run away for dear life. Okay, that there's no in between. No in between. I've been in these circles for years. Don't worry. Uh, anyways, um, do not do that tower. Do, do, Alex, do not do the tower. Not the stream for it. Anyways. Um, no, I, I think. Oh, God. Um, it's. Oh, yeah. Look at. Look at Ace. It's over, boys. It's over. <laughs> no prog GF. No prog metal GF. It, maybe you might find a few at like a faceless show, maybe. But they're crazy, too. They're like crazy, like four foot six Asian girl that probably will learn a bob at you, but that's probably, listen, you're probably too young for that reference. Unfortunately, listen, unfortunately, uh, Keen Machine from Faceless, he uh, he's starting to, uh, he's not in a good place, not a good place with the drugs and all that. <laughs> Anyways, um, I hate to say it, man. Key Machine, uh, RIP his his career. Um, <laughs> I, I hate this because I love the faceless, but it's just like Key Machine. <sighs> Anyways, uh, what you were saying, we're just getting distracted. What you were saying. About well, yeah, no, I, I do think that the millennial impact and the fact that there has been so much focus on the, you know, don't have children, don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, yeah. And I mean, so how do you sublimate that in the same way that like, as our good friend Stane Haynes says, he, he always says, you know, like Delicious Tacos is a fantastic writer because he's sublimating the fact he didn't have kids. And I think we're seeing like the inverse progressive mm. millennial woman do the same. Like, well, what are they doing? Well, they're sublimating the fact that they've been given a lie in the same way that I see like a lot of millennial resentment where, oh, boomers lied to us. Uh, everyone yeah. was raised to be told to 
go to college and get a good job. Really, everything that just happened is that you became an overproduced elite and now you're enjoying making, you know, you know, above minimum wage, but not in the career field that you wanted. And um, but you get does... snacks at work, though. Well, yeah, you get snacks yeah. at work where the company has a pizza party, but you don't really get a matching 401k investment, right? Um, and that sort of stuff leads to sort of a, a boilerplate level of resentment. And I think that, well, how do you do that? Well, you take it out on the next one, because I think that even if you don't have children, right, like everyone is scarred by their socialization, especially mm -hmm. in this like cultural generational victimhood mentality where it's just like, well, I don't want to be like my mom and dad. I don't want someone to get screwed up like I did. So uh, let's take, you know, current political orthodoxy that has been, uh, you know, shoved down my throat by every major corporation, algorithm, etc., and let's make sure that the next generation of kids get it right for a more sustainable and equitable future that they're not that's even That's what the boomers thought about us millennials, by the way. Huh? That's, that's what the boomers thought about us millennials, that we were going to be like the Gen Z, like we were going to be the like year zero final revolution generation. But that didn't pan out because we're terrible failures. But no, <laughs> no I think... We just didn't I, mow enough lawns to pay for college, Geo. Yeah, cool. exactly. Yeah, the Gen Xers, though... <laughs> They were the product of the older boomers and they were just as materialistic as the boomers as the, when they became yuppies, but they didn't have the same, um, some of them did, but they didn't have the same idealism. It very much was the anti-idealism of like snark and, uh, what, what is a, what does that AA call it? Um, cynical snark or he has a term for it, you yeah, know, something I mean. like that. Um, and by the way, uh, I hate to say it, but when I watched that stream, uh, it was the first, um, it was like the first Sargon stream in years where I actually like sat down and like listened to it all the way through. I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. Like the transformation of Carl Ben, of the, uh, the dawn of Swindon, the transformation is amazing. Um, yeah. and that was a great stream. You know, the Sargon of 2016 would never do that stream, but no. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, he basically had transformed into have you read lock into basically the guy knows his Roger Scruton. And I think that that's a pretty healthy evolution, right? Like it's, it's yeah. like a redemption arc almost to some people, but um, yeah, it was the first time I had, I had heard him sat down. He talked with, I think he talked with Oren McIntyre as well yeah. about yeah. the like failures of liberalism, yeah. um, which I, th I thought was just really, it was also really good. Um, and I think it does show that we all have good, uh capability like if you're on this side of things even if you are not as say extreme or it's a, it, your audience is particular liking or where they wish you can be i think it is demonstrative that people do grow on this side of politics i don't i haven't seen too many on, on the left kind of like do the same like i mean as we like as we saw with the 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 carl and dave talk right like um bread tube is kind of dead at the moment or at least you know what are they gonna not... do they're gonna become haas uh wide uh ron paul maoism no that's not gonna happen yeah but, no. Uh, no but but no it's yeah deadpan snark thank you TV. yeah um, deadpan snark or the yeah. eternal daria of just being a, a, a contrarian kind of cynic deadpan yeah. cynicism yeah but but think of it like where was sargon going to go i mean he was he wasn't obviously he like people on the left thought he was an Austrian painter, especially when he ran for UKIP. Uh, libertarians <laughs> didn't want him anymore. Um, I think Sargon, okay, here's my honest take, and I would love to talk to him one day, maybe on Same. content minded, yeah, yeah, or maybe on this show, we'll do it together. Um, we'll we'll go half seas. Oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, uh, you're in. you know, when you're in the Philippines and uh, you don't have enough money, uh, two for one, you know. Yeah, we that's a terrible reference, that's... man. I people, <laughs> yeah, I, I have to keep in mind I have the the Vatican flag in my bio, so I gotta keep that. Anyways, um, any oh boy, um, so no, but with Sar with Sargon, um, what's interesting is that here's my honest take. Okay, for I struggled with Sargon for years, whether liking him or hating him, but I think that for a time, he realized that being a gatekeeper was wrong. And that never will pay off. And that for the time being, official politics, was, especially in the English context, was not going to pay off. And I think that he seriously, he's the only person, one of the only people who seriously looked inside of himself that came out of that milieu of 2016. And by the way, Lauren Southern cast a little shade on him too, which I think, you know, like I'm going to write, I'm writing an article currently 
that default's going to shop around for me about that documentary. Uh, and the thing is with Sargon is he seriously looked at his influence. He seriously looked at his ideas. And I feel like he came out of the other end, maybe not being as popular as before, but certainly having a loyal and dedicated fan base and certainly still making a living and doing things that I think he feels are authentic. And, uh, but you know, for all of his faults, obviously for all of his faults. And I think that that's very rare. I mean, all of those people in 2016, I mean, uh, that, that's sort of the, the lum of, uh, alt light people. I mean, look how many of them fell. I mean, my God. Um, and it's, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I think, you know, I, I have less of a harsh opinion on Sargon than most of those other people. So, um, <laughs> Uh, what was Lauren heads in the chat was saying about, uh, I, but I mean, I mean, that's yeah. something I wholeheartedly agree with. And I mean, like I, I watched him a lot while I was in college when he like had finally just gotten his like start and, yeah, um, me too. you know, it's it, to see where he is now, considering how far like I've came politically from being like a run of the mill democracy appreciator, like a big Rand Paul fan to, um basically just like well you know <laughs> things are kind of screwed now aren't they kids but um yeah uh it is good to see where he is i mean having his own independent business that does kind of feel like a a, a british style daily wire i mean that's not a bad mm. gig to have for yourself uh we could go further but i mean I, um we have in our in our circle of friends we have people that definitely do watch it and i'm surprised to hear how much all of um uh, a lot of the our, our mutuals get referenced in there. So like Radical Liberation, Stephen Carson, right? He gets mentioned quite often on their um, academic agents talking points. We've had Apostolic Majesty featured over there to discuss history. So, I mean, um, it, it was always, a, you know, a very a, like a gateway, so to speak, which I mean, I think to a lot of the people that we may not agree with or may not like, um, you know, especially in, in this day and age where people are rebelling against, you know, influential bloggers, um yeah <laughs> that you know yeah that i mean we should you know people appreciate what they were which were which was gateways and yeah. um yeah. so i mean that's uh, something to always just keep in mind i think because there are plenty of people that will, will grow beyond maybe one day my audience will grow beyond me who knows but like <laughs> um you know hey be appreciative i think in the same way of like where you come from that's uh, that's been my take on it like it's really great to see where he is now but um you know be thankful that you know with that's the one thing that the liberals were definitely right about, or at least the, the data and society guys was yeah. just like, there was a network, there was a pipeline and um, they, uh, they identified it correctly because uh, that pipeline definitely led us down to where we are today. Yeah. And the, the, another observation that Dave had, um, but like last week about Sargon is that I think he could have like done things. I mean, everyone could do things a bit better. Like, I mean, when it came to that, the Paul was she an MP or a media person? The oh, oh yeah, yeah. There's what's her? Name? Then they brought him on the BBC with her, and it was terrible. <laughs> it was the and the white, you know what thing? That, yeah. Anyways, anyways, yeah. um, yeah. So, um, the threat no, but, that wasn't a threat. <laughs> yeah. You know what the problem is, though, is he was kind of a little bit right, though, about the white, you know what? Like, yeah. At the time, they were. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> but no, but that leads me to another point about what Dave said about the alt-right is that I remember when the alt-right, it's funny, the same time I listened to that, I was listening to um, a Twitter space with a uh, future Moldovan citizen and uh, Nightmare Vision. They do the, the night, the day owl and the night yeah. owl streams, right? And uh, they were talking about the uh the alt-right position on harvey weinstein back in the day and like how they had to like balance out their misogyny with their anti-semitism <laughs> so it's like um and and it's funny because there was this moment in 2017 where like especially the the hairdo right you know to quote philia to quote uh frankie marino and casino like you see the guy with the hairdo um he, he uh you know they were like oh you know i guess it's over demographics or destiny um, basically, uh, white people in the West are going to kind of be like living on reservations or we're going to be like, you know, that one group of people we hate, we have to operate like them. It's all over, you know, it's so that, but then from there in that despair, the memes came about, you know, but the thing is like when the alt-right was an avant-garde, like shitposting movement, that is when it was at its height of power. That's when they were trolling the media. That's when like Andrew Anglin got, uh, both dominoes and, and, uh, 
<laughs> both Domino's and Little Caesars to denounce white, you know what? Um, and it's, you know, but when people like the hairdo took it and made it into this organization, into this infotainment thing, Dave was 100% correct in that take. I feel like it's, I don't know, this one, the one guy we're talking about, it's kind of curious how he was the one to do that, right? Um, yeah. When they took something that was an avant-garde and made it into an institution, like that is when you have the sort of burden and the responsibility and really the folly of creating a political movement that isn't ready, that doesn't have um, significant institutional power. And I fear that the remnants of frog Twitter, the E-right, and or what people are calling the art right or whatever, I feel like the attempt to institutionalize it is having being being someone who's very deep into it. Yeah, I don't feel I feel uncomfortable with a hairdo figure coming about and being like, we need to create like we don't have to just talk about Club Tropical Excellence. We have to actually create it. I feel like when BAP creates Trump Club Tropical Excellence, I I feel like the idea of it in some ways in the internet age is more powerful than actually creating club tropical excellence, but maybe I, I could be wrong. It could be wrong, but well, uh, that, that yeah. was actually what I wanted to ask you because um, you know, in, in both in reference to our, yeah. our guest who's coming on in about 25 minutes or so, but also um, because there has been a lot of push um, for more like, you know, there has been the ongoing discussion about what is like right wing art. I mean, right, um, right, right. I, you know, M1776 had that big discussion and their debate over their first um, uh, official publication, not just the online bit, but, you know, volume one. Uh, we've seen Antelope Hill Publishing do a lot more art contests now. They're actually publishing their. Oh, really? Um, yeah, they're, they're going to do a publication of their uh, contest um, entries or the ones that they've selected, the, their small victories one. And uh, now, of course, of course um, Passage Publishing. So you being far more, uh, with far more history, uh, just by nature of, you know, being online and being in these spaces longer, but also as someone who is an artist, uh, you know, what, what is your take on sort of the, the move towards more uh, institutionalized publishing, art promotion, this, this sort of sell of right-wing art to perhaps a, a crowd that is not just you know frog twitter or not just mm -hmm. uh, the sort of decentralized network of right-wing content creators or commentators because in some way or form or fashion i think that it's a good thing but my there's also this like nagging thought in the back of my mind that it's just like you know maybe this is just going to be some sort of you know niche transgressive affectation, affectation that is going to just be like oh you know some rich people can like throw some money at it but it might yeah. not lead to substantial change your movement because i do cult, culture is important fundamentally right i think that the culture war is not going away i mean if if nope. they were like like dave had said the other day like if they acted like aristocrats there wouldn't be a culture war but they clearly don't um and i, I just that's that's sort of the things that i, I wanted to ask you considering you are mm -hmm. much more into the the art scene yeah i mean i i released uh me and astro to the twitter space on this and uh we were talking to Adam Lehrer and we talked to uh, Sam Buns, who were both amazing writers and our critics. And uh, I conclude like my, I started off, it was just me and Astro. And I started off talking about the fears I have of academics and people of those type journalists getting involved in mischaracterizing things. And I know I am 1776. They also had a Twitter space that we were responding to. Um, and, and the problem is I feel that when you do have something that's very much in community in this thing of ours, there will always be mistranslations. There will always be more importance placed upon certain things as opposed to the needs of academics and journalists and critics and so forth. And yeah. I feel like that's a big problem. I think that it's good that people are willing to throw money at it. They're, they're willing to create an avant-garde. I think that you have to learn from the lessons of the past art movements that were very much on the outside of uh, Vienna secession is probably in my mind, the best model um, that created the secessionist movement that created art nouveau that came off the heels of the symbolists that um, created a total artwork where decoration art um, design architecture, all of these things were being flourished um, you know, of course, the big ones being like Gustav Klimt and other ones. Um, I feel like Venus Secession very much is probably the model. And um, there's other ones. I mean, even the Impressionists have their, you know, 
against the uh, the Louvre and against like the the Academy. Uh, there, there's definitely a precedent there, even to an extent I would say um, Bauhaus a little bit, you know. But I feel like they were creating uh, artwork that was responding to the challenges of their own time. In our time, I think, I mean, I do fear that someone with money can come and influence us. But at the same time, it wouldn't be bad if the right wing had a Peggy Guggenheim or someone of that caliber to come and sort of give a voice to the tastemakers through monetization. I Maybe it's just because myself, I would love to be sponsored by a millionaire. But, you know, if Peter Thiel is listening to this, um, I know people who actually know Peter Thiel. And I tell them, please float your name, float my name to him. I will be your strongest soldier. Um, I will be your largest soldier. Um, <laughs> so please, Peter, please. I will. Yes, I will talk about transhumanism. Yes, I will talk about um, the uh, whatever, you know, but the dark side of the moon. Uh, no, but the thing the thing is, though, is that the problem is um, like I noticed there is the discourse around it unfortunately is more important than the actual things being created. That is a mistake, right? Because critics come afterwards. Yeah. To, to solidify something. You need a you need a Gertrude Stein figure. You need a Peggy Guggenheim with money. You need someone like a Clement Greenberg. Not like I'm not dog saying I'm just talking about art critics in general. You need someone like that. You need a Baudelaire to come in and formulate after the fact, not after the fact, but like in the middle, you can't have writers and critics at the very front saying that, Oh, we're going to create this art movement. We're going to create right wing art without the actual artwork behind it. That's the problem. I feel like there are some people I'm me and Matthew were scouring on Twitter and elsewhere that are small, that have relatively sh like, you know, not even in the hundreds follower account i know they're creating good work but i feel like you need to cultivate in-house people that are already there that don't have a large following people like wide dog someone who can create good works and someone who maybe even had experience within the art world um someone who already is in the art world someone like my friend uh well maybe i shouldn't say it i'll ruin it for him my friend julian nagayan uh you know people of that caliber who are actually doing fine art you can't just create a movement based off of critics for critics and for writers. That is the problem. And uh, please send your money or a manual typewriter <laughs> is your only hope for the aesthetic future. And <laughs> please, Peter Thiel, I'm desperate. But um, but that's what I mean. I think that's the big problem is that we're talking a lot. We're talking a lot. We're not doing. And, the, and But the thing is, though, that is the mission. I can't speak for and low pill, but I can speak for passage prize and, and passage publishing. That is the mission is to create something that combines discourse and the work of art, not just discourse. And, I and here's the thing. I love what Mark and a uh, Byzantine ambassador are doing. I love, you know, I am one of, uh, I am 1776, the strongest soldiers, but I, f you know, I feel that cultural criticism is good, but you actually need to profile people actually doing artwork not just profile, you know, as an art critic myself, you know, that's the big struggle is how do you balance profiling people that can create at least some prominence and then profile people who are, you know, other artists that are more advantageous to our message. That is the problem. Like, you know, and there's people that have been doing this for years, like my good friend, Paul talk, who have been ignored by various art movements for, uh, different reasons. But, uh, you know, um, uh, anyways, uh, well, yeah, yeah that, I, I yeah, mean, the, that's the, my big criticism. Okay, because like I, I a while back, I, earlier, I think, well, I want to say around January or February, I had, um, I had Alexander Adams on, who's yeah, over yeah, in the yeah, UK. Yeah. I mean, he's a, I like his work. He's written two really good books. I know he's doing a, a third one. I, I plan yeah. to have him on soon again because he wants to. He's also sort of in this like, uh, sort of institutionalized sort of deal. He he wrote this really great political pamphlet, which I'm going to interview him mm. on um about the the based barbican which he wants to create like a dissident uh art center or, or like an, an art center for dissidents and um he sort of recognizes that it's not i mean like you'd be subject to the state right but he says that like having some kind of institution or association yeah. 
does allow you to have those bigger names or to allow the sort of patronage of those, uh, both the critic, but also um, right, the, right, the, right. the patron as well. So, um, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think that that's the direction that I think should be viewed with much more of a positive lens than just, because like you said, if we, if there's the constant floundering of, of, of talk, then we'll be in a position where we're constantly talking and never doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Alexander is a friend of mine as well. And uh, we're going to do business pretty soon. Oh, good, and, good, uh, good. Content minded. And um, he has a very unique approach to the work of art. And uh, I, yeah, so he's a good example. Um, I, I, I'm trying to work over my friend Julian, but I know he has like, he's got other obligations and uh, it's funny though. It's funny though. Recently, the Berlin Review of Art, this writer that has sort of a tiff with him, uh, Julian was like just going ham on him because he did this painting where he would uh, paint with pastels and he'd touch it up in his iPad, then he would use the pastels further. And it was of his boyfriend. And yes, I said boyfriend. He's he's an aristocratic type of, uh, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> one of the gay, gay person. Uh, so, uh, Julian, uh, I can't believe they said this. this is an actual art publication. This is a well respected art publication. They mentioned Julian's painting in this digital art series. And they said, I kid you not, they said that Julian seeks promise is promising, but why would he put out another, and I quote, dead eyed twink painting? Dead eyed twink. <laughs> <laughs> and then julian was going ham on him that was amazing that was a big dead-eyed twink um no but julian's a good friend of mine and uh you know you need people i think that do have their foot in the door um my another friend who uh i've been talking to maybe i shouldn't give that up but uh my you know a, a good example would be gifts and given uh she actually is you know she actually did go to art school yeah. And, uh, she, you know, she is, I think, leading the way in terms of how you can approach the video and audio digital medium. Uh, and I think that, you know, you know, we talk a lot about that, like what will be the next thing? And I don't know what the next thing will be. And I think Dave doesn't know either. And I think that's why we're talking with him, because you get the sense that we all don't know we can approach what the next thing is. But unless you actually have people there to create it. Um, outside of the sphere of the big posters and the big writers yeah. and the, the hot takes, you know, you have to create something meaningful, not, not something that isn't, you know, like you said, an affectation, something that can be easily ridiculed or something that could be like, um, you, you know, something that doesn't seem utilitarian and which is virtually, I feel the discourse around it is very, um, a bit too utilitarian for my liking. In that, you know, oh, we have to create this thing. We have to create right wing art because it's going to be like a vehicle for something. Like, no, no, you have to take like more, you know, well, yeah, you, you, you don't want to treat it like, um, yeah, a, like for a lot of ways, politics can be kink because people can yes. find certain politics as transgressive. I'm writing an article about that though, yeah. but, um, that, that's well, the thing is that well, people are being like, well, right, like <laughs> we need right wing art because it's like, you know, but we don't need it because you want to treat it like a fetish community. You need to treat it yeah. because it's, it's something that you want it to be, which is part of high culture. Um, yeah. And otherwise, if not, then that's going to be an issue uh, down the line, because if it's just a bunch of guys, you know, sort of just basically in sort of a, a circle type fashion, um, just haranguing over the same things that they like over and over again. I mean, it's right. just, it just becomes sort of a, a, a club rather than a, an actual cultural thing. But there was something in the chat that kind of came into my, that I saw that was interesting where it's just like a lot of right wing memes though, have more of a mimetic value than there were cultural ones. I mean, right. um, which I think is kind of the, the common critique or the common thing we see back and forth about meme discourse. I can't believe I just said that out loud. There's a sentence yeah. I've never said before. Um, mimetic but like discourse. mimetic yeah. discourse. Um, and it, like the right does excel at the, at, at the meme space. And I, the, the best thing I saw was the, that infamous like lefty take on right wing memes compared to left wing memes, where it's just like, well, right wing memes inevitably like tug at the knee jerk reaction of what are fundamental truths compared to like the left trying to deconstruct and dismantle it, which is why it requires the wall of text. And I was like, that's yeah. just the most honest confession I've ever heard about like how this works, that you guys don't live in reality, you live in unreality um you well know. i live in unreality but you know that's well they live in a different form of it you yeah know? <laughs> we're, but, we're two different like we 
the castles in the sky that we live in are kind of separate. They, yeah. They're in different districts, in different that, zoning laws. Yeah. D- different zip codes in the sky. <laughs> um, no, no, but like the thing about the right wing meme is that the, the thing is, you know, you know, another thing, and this is another slap in the face to our enemies, okay. is that they could never create a critique of right wing memes or like what I mean by meta thinking. I mean, like not just the memes themselves, the image macros. I'm talking about mimetic thinking concepts as well, becoming memes in the right wing. Like, you know, you always say this all the time. Uh, like, you know, the right, like you, you were quoting, um, who you're quoting, Matt, you were saying, you know, the right wing has like maybe five concepts at any given time that they hammer away at. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So the thing is they could never come up with a critique that is more biting and more critical and more like weaponized and effective at torpedoing a right wing meme concept or a right wing meme itself than actual right wingers self critiquing them, which is again, I hear controversial statement. This is why the Amar Knights are fascinating because they're full of that. They like shred um, the pretensions of the E right on a daily basis. And in some ways, like the, the fact that you can have even 4chan posts that critique memes created on 4chan that are more effective than the later lefties adopt because they have like, it's way more effective. Again, this is why the Evolian, it's the same thing. The Evolian critique of uh, the Austrian painter was way more effective than G- Jason Stanley or anyone like, you know, or Umberto Eco because, you know, fa- fascism viewed from the right meme culture viewed from the right will always be more devastating as a way of clearing forth the the forest the the sort of rubble the the, you know after it's a forest fire it brushes out and it's for new growth yeah exactly then you have a new crop of right-wing meme culture that arises from that but i do feel that certain aspects are sort of perennial maybe because i'm biased because you know i come from that era but i feel like frog twitter will never truly leave us. You know what I mean? Like yeah. frog Twitter has that, that sort of a, it's very true. What metaphor said that we will for since 2016, we're condemned to hear whispers and murmurs of 2016. It was our boon and now it will be our curse. Right. Yeah. Like same with DeSantis. Everyone, everyone wants 2016. Yeah. Every, Apogee. everyone wants another 2016. We all want the apogee moment where it was just, yeah. everyone could watch the, everyone wants another moment of the inauguration where that woman in the glasses and the beanie just screams when yeah. like, he is now the president of the United States. Everyone wants that. They and need it's a that, mural of her. Yeah. It's a cathartic. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants yeah. another find the flag. He will not divide us. It, it is the ultimate moment where we are forever cursed with the nostalgia of what can we ever do it again. Um, and I don't, that moment will never come back, I don't think. We are kind of trapped there. Um, but I mean, the thing that I also think is, and again, the reason why I think they're more biting, like right-wing critique of it is more biting, is because I think everyone and their mother has already taken a look through that European Union documentation about like hate memes um, you know, it, I don't know if you've taken the time to, to sift through it, but I mean, I saw the Stain Haynes, uh, thread of it. Yeah. One of our best, one of our best, one of our best. By the Haynes. way, I hope, I hope Warren wasn't offended by certain statements, uh, Stain made on content minded. I hope not, <laughs> but you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that, that was the thing about the, that handbook thing is that it'll have the most sort of, uh, normie type deal of just like, well, here's the woe Jack. And then right next to it, we're going to be talking about, you know things that obviously glow like it was almost a, a reflection of themselves compared to just the most yeah. uh, you know sort of the most milk toast thing like they had a whole page on apustache and then right next to it it's about like <laughs> and they know. got so many things wrong too because like, they'll like, never know <laughs> they're not a part of it because it's so yeah. easy this is the thing about um what what's the word i'm looking for like what um it's so easy for like with the gatekeeping aspect of it. It's almost as if it's like early 4chan again, where it's just like, oh, you know, Triforce, the, the rules of like 4chan and whatnot, you know, Millhouse is not a meme, is a meme. Um, all those things about it, right? How easy it would be to gatekeep. I'm not new F, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to say it on YouTube. Yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. Um, how easy it was the gatekeep? The same thing can be done here. It becomes very easy to point out a faker. It becomes very easy to point out someone studying it. Um, and I think that that does offer sort of a uh, a good way of, you know, of them never understanding. They will always constantly be looking yeah. on the ether. And I say this completely unaware of my, you know, who I could be wrong. Maybe well, one day they do get it right. But. Th- there is a one part where they talked about the pine tree 
being some symbol of some hate group. Pine Tree came from Pine Tree Twitter. It came from people reading Kaczynski and Linkola and yeah. Jensen. It and came from the Eco know. guys. Yeah, it came from like, you know, Storm King and uh, Dharma King and, uh, you know, Borzy and, well, me too, a little bit. Uh, you know, um, who else? Uh, well, but my good fan. friend. Yeah, my good friend, a uh, trash world citizen, you know, like, yeah. Uh, What's this orange I mean, block to um, uh, abstain hand? Oh, no. Oh, probably for the notice and move on reply. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, like, the other thing that was, like, for me, I, I thought about it, and I was like, they said it had something to do with, like, some, like, ethnet position. And I was just like, I always saw the pine tree as, like, the Yankee appeal to heaven, you know? Yeah, like, I never it is. It, it is that, I never yeah. associated it with anything else than that. But, you know, what? <laughs> yeah. It, it does tell you how far out that they are or maybe they're just in a way it's like tattling on themselves where it's just like well these are the guys and the groups that we've created and here's what we've you know reported on ourselves it's a uh, <laughs> it's almost a, as if an exhibitionist style of like yeah. oh you know um did i do that kind of deal uh <laughs> but it's very interesting though i think that um as as time goes on, definitely like the like the vibe shift thing. Uh, Dave should visit Pine. There, there's there. There also there's account Pine Barons. I'm neglecting. Um, but no, I think that you know the sort of usual like what Dave was alluding to the usual politics of the 2010s aren't going to work anymore. Um, what's going to come out? Like he was saying, there's no separation in the left anymore between the activists and you know the administration. Um, I feel like in the right wing there. Trump in some ways was kind of like that as well, because yeah. Trump was like signaling different, um, you know, different memes all the time. Cause like, let's face it, it's the same people that, you know, it's funny. The one guy that got outed, he actually followed me. I it was mutuals with him. The guy that worked for Tucker, uh, he had to go away. Right? Oh yeah. For his, uh, spicy posts and the, forums yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. There are people that probably work for Tucker Carlson that are probably monitoring us right now i oh, know I, because people I, I know because yeah. i've gotten i i know i can't i can't say too much about it but i know that people who yeah. work close to tucker um kind of know who we are uh which again i think that that's a, a good thing i mean say whatever your Tucker's opinion of Tuck, my they, uh my my fedora yeah track. well <laughs> you know the tucker carlson quote tweeted or you know basically read out uh crk before he read <laughs> yeah, out. <laughs> yeah 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 so you know oh, i mean I, in my opinion it's only a matter of time but uh i think that for whatever your opinion is of tucker carlson though like oh, one man. of the things that sort of the artistic art right new right whatever <laughs> you want to call it right one of the benefits that it does have i think is is that it can serve as a decentralized network of influence upon a larger crowd which is great yeah. right but like at the same time um, it does mean that there is sort of a, a decentralized chattering network class compared to perhaps the thing that really people do want, which is meaningful change. But yeah. at the same time, right, that means that, you know, there are there is a, a time and place for everything. Like there's a, a political caste system of influencers, commentator, sort of chit chat, commentary, uh, yeah. activists official media heads like entry style you know in into in political organization yeah and and the thing is though the unfortunately is that there does seem to be a pervasive sense of stagnation and who knows what will awaken it if there's new posters that are coming up down the pipe that could potentially do some interesting things um who are making moves behind the scenes uh, I know that there has been a number of successes, you know, Zero HP's book, um, you know, the plate engravings provided to him by Mike Ma, things of that nature. Um, I've, you know, I've done a few book covers. I have one I have yet to release uh, for people. And, I, you know, I think that uh, there are interesting people doing interesting things, uh, you know, New Right Podcast, um, you know. Yeah, um, what Matt and Dan are doing are great because it's yeah, just a, it's yeah. a great network hub to to find other writers um, there was someone on Twitter today who's like, I'm dedicating my whole sub stack to just reviewing books by, you know, uh, anons on Twitter. Uh, yeah, there's I think Art of a, Darkness podcast as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think um, that those things are good because it, it's a information, information like nexus for just like, here is the alternative to, to, to culture because, you know, as they continue to sort of extinguish any sort of cultural memory or um, condition to traditional you know high culture items like 
I, I, they will sort of be left up to the taking or up for us to sort of take the reins on them. I mean, yeah. I think the consequence of it, and I think when Dave comes on, we can ask him about it more, is that, oh, that just means that like traditional European high art and cultural things will just be explicitly right wing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you yeah, you the that. opera, you're not some New York style multimillionaire that enjoys, you know, shaking hands and rubbing shoulders. It's that you're some right wing Twitter anon that likes it because like a bunch of Jannies deemed it to be problematic or, you yeah. know, too white. Yeah, like uh, Art of Darkness, we're in talks right now. Um, probably by the autumn, we want to do an episode uh, where I cover the works of Anis Nin, which that's going to be, that's going to be quite hair raising. Actually, <laughs> if you know about her work, you know, about the, uh, the in uh, zest type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, going yeah. On. yeah. 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 Um, no, but she's a brilliant writer. I love her essays. I love her work, even though she led a very complicated and terrible uh, life lifestyle. Um, and yeah, so we're going to talk about that. Um, New Megadeth album's coming out soon. Oh, I hope so. I, I hope Dave still has enough into him. Dave Mustaine. Um, but no, I think that he's okay. So Dave distributed Dave, not Dave Mustaine. Although I would love to talk to Dave Mustaine. One day. <laughs> um, but I mean, really, in some ways, distributed is like the Dave Mustaine of our thing in some ways. But that's oh, that's a controversial take. Um, no, um, I feel that he's right in the sense that you, I've just pointed out two podcasts right off the bat. Yeah. When it comes specifically to literature, and literature is not my forte. Okay, I'm not Logo de Atlas. Okay, you know, so um, but or you're you telling know, me you haven't read uh, Evola's book on Theosophy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I haven't read Gravity's Rainbow. Okay, maybe one I'll read. Actually, I, I do like Wyndham Lewis's visual art, but uh, no, so New Right and Art of Darkness, those are two, you know, I mean, Kevin himself is a playwright, you yeah. Know? There's, you know, your, your T.R. Hudson, our good friend. Yeah, um, so by, by new write, we mean W-R-I-T-E. Yes, uh, new Like you're write. writing something. Yeah, right, yeah, write literature. And, uh, you know, I had a great episode with them, uh, which I have to get to promo. I should release a promo video on my channel. Um, but if you go to their, po it's, a, it's for free, but if you go to their um, Patreon, it's there. It's yeah. uh, one of the more recent episodes. You, you can um, also find it on uh, Spotify as well. That's where yeah. I've been listening to it. yeah. And I believe I'm also on Spotify because I put everything in Anchor. It's like the automatically. Oh, there you, you go. Know. Look at that. Yeah. I should probably do that too. Yeah. Um. And so th the point being is that Dave is correct in that when the leftoids get rid of high culture, and like totally, then there will, like, we will start like looking at um high literature that isn't like what he was saying, what the neocons like, which is like typical of Maris Locke, like Mark Twain, Um, not to bash Mark mark twain but you know like they're not le reading like norman mailer or gene wolf or uh you know like i think the right wing has a good sense of literature unfortunately i do think the right wing needs to work on visual art but there's you know me and a few other people we're, we're getting there we're getting there um but the right wing they do have either obsession with film mm -hmm. or literature and i feel like visual art if me and people like Owen Cyclops and people like, you know, Matthew and the people that I'm friends with, uh, like Wide Dog and a few smaller people and yeah. people like Gifts Given. if we could probably, this is my hope anyways, to create the same niche of right wing visual art as there is with literature and film. Although not like actual producing films, but film critique. I mean, I don't have to like, I mean, I you just go, you just go to Devin Stack's channel. Okay. Just go, yeah. go to Black Pill. You'll, You'll find a bunch. I mean, we do film critique all the time. We can probably next week we're going to do some more. So, um, no, and, and yeah. And, uh, so we, we actually have a few film things that we have lined up, but, uh, so yeah, I think it's, um, it's promising in that regard, but I don't see how you can create, I can sort of see the groundwork for creating something new. Well, let's just wait till Dave gets here. Let's wait till Dave gets Yeah. Here. I just wait, sent wait, wait. him a, a DM cause it, the stream yard invite I gave you apparently had some issues. And so, yeah. Um, that's the same one I sent him. So hopefully he gets it because he says he's backstage, but apparently okay. it's the wrong one. So I need to. So uh, what are you going to talk about with the mold bug piece tomorrow? Oh, so that's next week. Um, I guess okay. I'll announce that now. Uh, so, um, Jeremy Carl wrote, uh, a piece in the American mind about, uh, sort of beyond, um, elves and hobbits about yeah. the culture war. And the only reason why I know about this piece is because um, I got tagged in one of his tweets as like a thank you for uh, as inspiration on the article, which 
Whoa. Um, which I was like, oh, um, I didn't because I haven't really talked about the article. I just said that um, I, I just said I really disagree with it. Um, but I, you know, I got tagged in it. I sent him a DM and uh, we're going to talk about it next week. Nice. So that'll be really the the next yeah. big question is um, one second here. Yeah. Oh, we got Saturnalia Sundown in the chat. My good friend. Yeah. I want to so, get I mean, him on the concept mind good. tune. Uh, yeah. Want to be hard. To, um, won't be hard to dispose of stuff like Bill O'Reilly's The Death of Books as highest conservative literature. Yeah, that's true, man. Remember when Bill O'Reilly used to go off about that? Like, uh, and, and yeah, like. I mean, Bill O'Reilly just decided to say screw it and just start writing books. I don't know if he has a ghostwriter or not, yeah, but well, um, speak of the devil uh, or angel, really, we should say. We'll put him in. There you go. Hello. Hi, Dave. guys. How's How it going? Hey. <laughs> good, good. Hey. How's right. it going, Gio? It's been a long time. I know, eh? <laughs> Since my uh, departure from uh, Follow the Rules. So, um, I think I actually was on uh, Break the Rules or whatever, uh, and I was expecting to see you, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> I saw, it was, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, that was quite a stream. I saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, that, that was, uh, I was kind of a, a weird. It brought me back to the whole Andy Worski days a little bit, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone remembers but, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Um, there's a recent arc with Andy Worski, but let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> you know, oh my God. Um, but yeah, so we were talking about your your um, your essay, which you turned into a video, and your um, well, Pr Prude, you go ahead. It's your channel. oh yeah yeah your so, channel this week and next uh, week. Sure, sure. <laughs> we, well, we were we gonna were... do it. We were gonna think about like doing it the digital archipelago when we have different people, but it was kind of mm -hmm. last minute to be like. Dave, can we like invade your channel for one night? You know, one <laughs> ECW no, I, I one night stand. <laughs> yeah, you know. I here's one thing. It just seems it just seems to me that uh, the edited the edited video thing is just really on its way out. I, mm. I'm for me, it's hard because I don't have time to make them anymore or as much as I do. Like other than the ones that I just posted, like but but it also seems like they're just less popular these days too. Yeah, they are. Um, I noticed the standalone video, the edited video, um, it is going its way out. I mean, unless you're willing to do something creative with it, like I have a few scripts for um, stuff that kind of looks like Meltdown, you know, by mm -hmm. the end. Um, so, but yeah, I think that people just, they. I think they want, pod, like podcasts are eternal because they kind of are like friendship simulators and they do, <laughs> uh, they do provide a parasociality to them that the edited video can. And I think like, um, so we were talking about the observations that you correctly made. And uh, we were talking about your live, I, I was watching your live stream recently, the one you did. And uh, we were talking about your observations about how mm -hmm. the sort of vibe shift is happening. I know I hate that term vibe shift, like uh, for the time being. Um, <laughs> oh, what, I, what else are you going to call it, though? I mean, it's like yeah, something exactly, is yeah. something is different in 2022 than it was before. Exactly. I don't know. We're in a different world now. And, and it is funny because um, as a millennial lull myself, I mean, I'm approaching uh, the big 3-0 this December. So mm. I'm kind of terrified. Um, but we were talking about the need and the problems of creating an art movement and a literary movement. Because I myself am very much in the center of things like the passage prize and passage publishing and other, you know, things that people are doing and the sort of need to create, I feel that there's enough talk about it. There's the critics, but unfortunately with every art movement, the critics sort of come on the back end. The critics, yeah, of course. Yeah. The, but the problem I'm noticing is that, and you know, me myself having written about or having being, being a critic myself as well as an artist, I feel like the critics and the literature around the work of art, around the need to create the right wing work of art, even whatever that means. I mean, that term itself is problematic in the sense of like yeah. instrumentalizing the work of art. But I feel like the writers and the critics, they're at the front of the house instead of the back of the house. There needs to be people actually creating to do these things. And uh, before we go on, uh, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on. A prude. I'm. I'm just talking right now. Oh no, you're fine. No, we're we do the just as equal, I'm equally as appreciative. Uh, what, what is what? Well, is, well, uh, I, I'll host you guys on my channel sometime too. That's my, at least I could do. But uh, you know, um, yeah. I mean, I, this is always the question: is that it's it's hard. You know, uh, there are a lot of right wingers that create art. Short, uh, you know, other than a, zero HP Lovecraft, no one immediately comes to mind. Or you know, Bronze Age pervert. You know, but that's a little bit. You know, there there aren't. Right now, there aren't a lot of people that are very, very um, in, in sort of si siloed into 
specific online spaces. But I think that we're really in early days. I think that it just, it just, what you're going to see here is just the emergence of people doing things and having it be called right wing because it, because by, by the, the spirit it taps into, it, it has sort of the wrong ant smell. Yes. This is something I said, like in, in, yeah. you see this in sort of, um, the, the recent sort of, there was a bunch of vandalisms, not quite, kind of fake vandalisms a little bit, but still nevertheless vandalisms with this whole climate protest around classical pieces of art, right. which would have, you know, classically, at least since post 1975 rules would have been totally off limit for the left. Yeah. yeah you're and, right. yeah. and, but, but this is what's going to happen is that it's, it, what's going to create the right wing art movement is that, Things are just going to smell right wing by virtue of them not being a mainstream left wing. Yeah. And that's going to create sort of a market for people who want that kind of thing. And the more it gets identified as right wing, that will just become the space for right wing art organically. You know, I think that there are going to be some people who are just right wingers and they set out to make a piece of right wing art. But, you know, I think most of it's just going to be. Your 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 text has the wrong ant smell, and so the, the the label will come from 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 outside in. The accusations yeah. will, be, will be, you know, Dave Chappelle is called right wing right now. I mean, is he really right wing? Well, not really in a meaningful way, but yeah, yeah. And and uh, you know, unless you want, like you were saying, explicitly to be like a McNaughton or like a Ben Garrison yeah. or a D RIP diesel illustrations to a legend. Um, but, th but those create, I think maybe not with McNaughton, but certainly with Ben Garrison and these illustrations and to an extent stone toss, they create their own sort of folk poetics of largely internet based content and like chasing the fantasies and the paranoias and the, wish fulfillments of the right wing they become the sort of like folk praxis through agitation and propaganda similar to say 90s feminism with barbara kruger uh but i before we go i have a theory so i'll take on the uh mm -hmm. the environmental thing if you want to hear it yeah um to me i think the motive like okay first of all it's probably an inside job it's probably there's some gallery people that support them oh yeah for it's sure not, not organic but i think <clears throat> their logic is that you okay? It, it goes beyond, in my estimation, the typical left wing. It's colonialism. It's you know that one rapper in the the National Gallery in Scotland talking about you know Morgoth had that video about him, like talking about uh, you know oh why I look at all these white men they're so great I don't care about them blah blah blah. It goes mm. beyond the usual like leftist neuroses around Western art styles. I think their opinion is that given the face of human extinction through um, anthropogenic global warming or through some kind of disaster, that they think, they're thinking in terms of like the nihilists and the antinatalists like Thomas Ligotti, that, or even like, you know, object-oriented ontology people, they talk about the limit of human cognition through this mass existential threat. So in their mind, they're saying that who cares about the work of art, who cares about the great accomplishments of a civilization's past, because we're faced with this like total annihilation and therefore nothing has meaning in the face of ecological yeah. task. It's like sort of like what Adorno, it, you know, I love it, it, Adorno. except for, you know, gay, gay orgies, right? Like yeah, those are yeah, sacred. Yeah. Like you can't, yeah, like if there's there, any negative consequences from those, you couldn't possibly prohibit them. That would be insane. <laughs> yeah. But it's sort of like what Adorno said, and I love Adorno's work, obviously, but, uh, he said, you know, there's no poetry after the, um, how should I say it on YouTube? Um, what do we say? Mid-century German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No so poetry after 45. Ex no poetry after 45. Exactly. So, um, it's sort of the same mentality is that there is no work of art after this total annihilation of even the capacity to think about these things to begin with. But that is sort of like, I think the average activist did not see it that way. They probably do see it as like, you know, like uh, climate change is integral to environmental racism or some crap like that. But the real theory cells in the background in deep ecology, they are thinking of these things in those terms, which is very terrifying. Like if you read, uh, help me out, help me out, Matt. I, I just, I always forget his name. I always like forget how to pronounce it. 
Yuval, Evil, Evil, Yuval Noah Levin. Harari. Evil Noah Harari. Uh, well, yeah, no, Yuval Noah. Yeah, the, the, Yuval the, Noah the guy Harari. who wrote Homo Deus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Evil Noah. <laughs> Evil Noah Harari. Evil Harari. Evil yeah, Harari yeah. is how I've heard it pronounced. Yeah, yeah, but but that's the thing. I think like when you talk about the sort of fine, and this is again what Heidegger talks about. This is like the final enframing of the human, the final instrumentalization of what we know to be the human in relation to the environment. Now, there's a lot of great works of art. There's this great book I have called uh, Art After the Anthropocene. Um, but the problem is that, like you were saying, the attack on the work of art is a very interesting development because no longer does art serve the purpose of bringing awareness to this ecological catastrophe. Now art has to be abolished with mm. everything else. So it's like this weird, like, uh, I, I maybe I'm thinking because some very nihilistic tech bros are probably behind a lot of these movements. I don't know. Me, Noah Harari could be one of them. But uh, the way that these people talk about art and culture and the human, the human subject is uh, quite terrifying in my estimation. It's a, it's the most alien thing to my uh, Catholic worldview there is, you know. Um, so well, I, I'm just rambling right now. I'm very. No, sorry. no it's fine, man. No. Uh... Uh, again, on the, y y Yuval Harari, I think his name is the Yuval Harari. I don't know how serious is this because it, it, the only thing it I me mean, talks about this like, well, humans are hackable. That there needs to be a great reset. There needs to, you know, that's I'm mixing uh, I'm mixing Klaus Schwab with Yuval Harari, but they're the same crowd. There needs to be a great reset. Humans are hackable. We can't go back. This is the way things are now. But the, the, that just. It, all this does is sort of reassert the question that Lenin brings, who, whom. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, sure, I'm all for a great reset, but I think that I'd reset different things than than Klaus Schwab would, and hey, maybe humans are hackable. But why am I not hacking Yul Harari? Why is the conversation about him hacking me? The, the, right. the, 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 at the end of the day, the, since I don't believe in an assertion of righteousness, or even any contest of values, they're, they're just saying, okay, we're in charge, and, and now we're going to force you into this managerial box. But the managerial box is is justified by, I guess, competency, because they believe that, they believe that the managerial state is the only way to manage a burgeoning world. Maybe that is, but it, even that doesn't really defeat the larger, uh, the larger question. The larger question is, what is the ultimate fate of humanity and what are we being managed towards? That's the ultimate question. And I think that, you know, I, this year I really want to break with Aaron McIntyre. Aaron McIntyre thinks that the enemy is the managerial state. Uh, I think it's sort of the godless and soulless world that the managers, these particular managers are moving us towards. Yes. I certainly do not like the managerial state in, in the sense that I don't think it's a very uplifting way of organizing humanity. But the 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 process of sort of centralizing things into management institutions, to my mind, is pretty secondary spiritually. the The biggest problem is the fact that the product, the human product of the managerial state, is disgusting and vile right, right. and no, a creature not worthy of existence. But and the their only thing is to do is, and, and if managerialism was absolutely inevitable, the way that people like Klaus Schwab and you, you Val Harari imagine say, it yeah. is. If it's absolutely inevitable, then like, because the, the thing is, the, 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 their own objectives belie its inevitability because they, they don't really even have a vision of what humanity should be except to be more manageable by managers. So like, we're, we're, we, uh, humanity is inevitably going to be managed. And it's inevitable. We can't stop it. And so the managers have to manage humanity to become more manageable. It's just their life like, at the end of the no, day. It's, like, it's their life. circular, right? Yeah. I mean, like, and so, like, but it, so you can't, and you can't be more manageable than dead when you think about it, right? Right, but and, that's not the point, though. That's the point of biopolitics: is that you aren't dead. You, your, pr the prolegation of life is the real terror. It's the real goal of the manage of the managers. It's the promulgation of life rather than yeah, you you can't yeah. be more manageable than a bioorganism stripped of all external needs, inputs and outputs. Exactly. And that exists it, it, just to justify it. it's I mean this is this is where the transhumanism stuff all kind of falls down is that it lacks a teleology and it lacks a definition of humanity. And you know these these 
idiotic transhumanists who think that they're going to achieve immortality because they can rewrite human desire. They can rewrite the human brain, you know, yeah. so they can write it into a computer. But if you can write a human brain into a computer, you can rewrite a human brain to desire its own death. Mm -hmm. And a human brain that desires its own death is much cheaper to maintain than an immortal, immortal computer god. So these people, these people like, you know, uh, the Harari and Schwab and Eliezer Yudikowsky for the more like online rationalist people, it just, it just, it's, 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 it's absolutely soulless, and it's, I mean, and it's also absolutely circular. This has the same kind of intellectual salience as the definition of woman that is feels like a woman. It, it, it's just a circular piece of logic that just justifies a pure exercise of power. But, but that's what you were saying though, is that within the framework though, within the sort of post enlightenment instrumental reason, the logic of this godless, soulless biopower that we're confronting is, is to them in their self-contained and closed system. It's the natural course. It's like, what do we do after the death of God? You know, we give people this glorious future of being managed and it's like they become, their needs are met, the rental economy, but you, you know, all this, this yeah. spiel. Well, but I isn't think, this where the hackability oh, sorry, kind of comes in here though? Cause I mean, this, this goes back to your talk with Carl, Dave, that I thought was the interesting point. Cause Carl kind of points out rather accurately there that you both had agreed on that. Like the, the sort of the Western point where it is now is that we are, we are beings distinctly outside of time and history. And I think that there is something very uniquely hackable about that, that, that allows yeah. them to sort of double down. I mean, so we become these unique beings outside of history, that sort of end of history bit out of the Cold War. And so, but you need a final, dare I say, a final victory uh, in order to maintain this sort of uh, in, in post-enlightenment, post-Cold War high, where, you know, we've managed through liberal managerial capitalism. We've, we've managed to win over this other existential threat. We need something else to maintain the you know permanent exception right to to take on from from schmidt there and what better way than to come up with sort of this globalized um sort of eschatology with you know the sort of anthropomorphic climate change because now oh humans can be hackable because we're, we're doing this in the name of a much larger existential threat and i mean when you replace um like you had said you replace the teleology you base you you replace god I mean, what else is there to do than to try and act like God yourself and manage everyone in the wake of this sort of uh, coming disaster? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is, uh, well, I mean, it needs an eschatology, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense, right? That's another problem, too. And this is the, the main role that global warming plays. I think that, you know, to be honest, yeah, I think that the deep ecologists really... The, the people who actually believe this stuff on the ground are a pretty small percentage of people. And no, no none of these, these people, the, these, the ordinary progressive is worships consumerism. I yeah, mean, they're, they're not, and their yeah, consumption. yeah, yeah. They're, they're not like these back to the earth hippies. I mean, they'll, they'll castrate themselves for global warming, but they'll castrate themselves because they don't want to have to actually sacrifice for children. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I feel very, under this new vibe shift, I'm very confident that the aesthetics of sort of the human and the, the old and the, and the traditional and, and, and really the, the post-progressive, they will always win out over the, the fully luxury consumer communist, uh, you know, uh, gorging himself on bug burgers and you know, porn. But I think that that what's going to try, what they're going to try to do, you know, what 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 the managers would want is just that. Okay, well, look, art is done, mm -hmm. art is done, and the public space is done. I, we don't want you going outside and meeting up with friends and coming into contact with dangerous people that might have more attractive ways of life or more authentic ways of life. Uh, we just you know, you, you need to do your duty and castrate yourself in one form or the other and just stay online and consume and, you know, we'll control the knobs that, that control consumption and, you know, we'll give you a new flag to put on your profile, social media profile every three months. And I think this is why I have a little bit of optimism, like, as you had mentioned in your, um, your, your sunset stream about how, like, the more progressively, like, they continue to, like, make uh, sort of traditional Western high culture, like it, it'll just become right wing. 
I think that um, the thing that Twitter has done with all these new writers and people coming out, like we had mentioned earlier today on the show about the new right podcast, W-R-I-T-E or the Art of Darkness podcast, all these things, I think, kind of give way for a, sort of this sort of like a, a cultural decentralized renaissance of sorts because like okay if they're going to make uh you know botticelli paintings uh you know like right wing or too wide or too european rate i mean i think that that might encourage people to, to paint in this style i think that, that might encourage um people to take things like opera and make that more of a uh sort of regular drug brains to appreciate or consume it may not be the same i don't think it ever would yeah. be but no, well, well the problem is that opera is just it, it's incredibly expensive to produce yeah. Well, sure, and, but I, the operatics, or at least the music, is what sure. I'm more referring to. There might be a market for this. But, but even, like, inspiration from, I would say, like, the early to later 20th century, like, the second wave modernists, I mean, they will become deeply problematic as well. I would even... It's already starting, I think, often neglected. I mean, I know um, you were talking about um, that Nulls guy against uh, Fantano... Oh, I can't even see his name, uh, Fantano, um, about abstraction. But I do feel that what we're seeing now, even maybe just in the contemporary world, but also with illustration, um, we're seeing this sort of like return to figuration, but a return to like wokeified, like terrible, um, sort of like hammering home the message of illustration and fi figuration specifically. Um, you have a lot of like, uh, you have a lot of paintings of the black bodies and all that, and you know, the, the trans body and so forth. And sort of like, it's very much, I think that the relation between what a lot of people unfortunately think of as high art when it comes specifically just to realism and when it comes to other forms of expression, now we are, this is complicated, this relationship. And I do feel that there are some surrealists and abstract expressionists and so forth, especially the, the expressionists that have a sort of like very quote unquote problematic relationship to the narrative. And the fact that some of them are being periodically canceled right now, I mean, I think is, um, I don't think you can really trad LARP your way into like a bunch of people painting like Botticelli or like Titian. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, no, there's some people. But Botticelli is not our world. Exactly. Like, yeah. No one believes in that stuff. What what the, the the first the first step in our world is to have art that actually depicts the monsters that live in our world. Like, I hate to say it, but like mm -hmm. we're we're in the age where we're monsters kind of walk among us and uh, only only people only some people can see them and and they're they're not depicted properly and they're they're not uh, and our own lives are not challenged because we're encouraged to be uh put in this in this um uh, we're, we're being encouraged to kind of put in uh, we're, we're being encouraged to uh turn away from this and not not actually look at ourselves in the mirror yeah yeah but th there is i think there's certainly work being done with that i feel that the problem is that there has to be a stage where that can transform into more of a positive vision but i do think that there are people that you know even people that i've judged for the passage prize who are doing that i mean i've done that to an extent i will do it currently in the future um i recently printed off my uh doom jack uh wood cut i don't know if you could see that one there you go <laughs> that's that's a fun little piece though but uh you know nice uh, yeah but uh no but i i do feel that 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 is a good way i think that there are people doing work of that nature that are even spoofing this the sort of popular Ill illustrative styles of uh, the, the the sort of contemporary left like uh you know flat design and so forth um but flat, flat yeah. design is really amazing though when you think about it like how yeah yeah you, i can't even go like i can't even if you turn on the tv and just watch it for five minutes you you can't go like 15 minutes of watching commercials without seeing the horrible design pattern i can't think of anything like it in my lifetime when when modern culture has been so you know, dominated by like a really ugly type of art like that. Mm -hmm. it, because it has a cultural and a market logic to it in terms of what, where the corporate, the corporatocracy wants to go. And uh, I mean, I, I've actually, I'm, I'm going to start writing about it. Um, me, I know the person who originated the term, my good friend, Eli Schiff, who was working in the uh, design industry till he was viciously canceled uh, because I think as he pissed off the design team at Uber and Twitter. That's why they canceled him. But uh, he came up with the term humans of flat design. 
and uh, there's many much work to be done. Um, I I think that really, in no sense, where can you go with that? You know what I mean? Like where are they? What what next? Like that is the all like after flat design. That's it. Where are they going to go next? Well, it seems I, like, you know, I, I know by recommending a, a, an art, uh, like a particular piece of art, you, uh, you you immediately sort of damn it to not being ever made, which I have a problem with. But I, I'm, I'm probably not the first person to think of this, but I always want to see like the humans of flat design. If you see this on like Google commercials or Verizon commercials, they're always kind of propaganda for this sort of multiculturalist globalist state. Like everyone's like jet skiing and going around on these vibrant festivals and eating food. Uh, what if you just had the humans of flat design, like actually in the squalid existences where we find ourselves? <laughs> you know, the, what, what is the, the 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 squalid life of of uh, of a human of flat design that ends in like SSRIs or suicide or something like that? There was that one and, artist that did the New Yorker illustrations. What's your name? Uh, mm -hmm. Mo Molon Morhan. Uh, that it was like they all have like the dead SSRI stare women, and she had the the infamous New York Time New Yorker cover where she was like covered, like she was in her apartment, you know, covered in filth. You know, mm. you know the the cat box in the background. Uh, you know, so it's funny because I think they're even more open. Like there, there is a, in the contemporary world, there is a number of these millennial women who are promoted, who create works of art, essentially of like you know fat women uh, raiding the fridge. And I've seen paintings like this. Oh, it's like literally the art version of women's posting their L's online. It's like women's yeah. <laughs> posting their L's in the art gallery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen this with my own eyes. And there, there are some that do it a bit better, like Jenny Savile, but then there are ones that just, it's very horrible, millennial pink pastel, t like post Tumblr aesthetic type of posting, um, you know, with the work of art. Uh, the but problem is that there's a component of narcissism to that that can't be avoided. And yeah, yeah. the problem is that narcissism and looking at people and kind of putting them down it's, you know, maybe in a previous age that would have been something that would have actually inspired us to change, but really that just sort of inspires us to feel good about the school places we found ourselves. Yeah. And, and that's, that's sort of the opposite emotion that we should be feeling right now. Well, there's a, another comic artist where she basically, I, I, I kid you not, uh, she draws all these uh, illustrations, these comics where it's all about hating her husband. And oh yeah, I remember that. Child. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, oh. they're childless, but you know, it's <laughs> and that comes up too is the justification why they're childless. But yeah. it's just, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible picture into the psyche of the <laughs> the millennial women. But um, anyways, moving on. What what prude you wanted to? Oh well, there were there were a few yeah. things that I, I kind of was thinking about as you two were talking, like the the like the whole Joyce Carol Oates thing about you know white male manuscripts. I mean, the self publishing part is a, is a good byway through that. But again, like we talked about before you came on, Dave, I think that mm -hmm. there is some positive developments and maybe the institutionalization of more of these publishing houses, more art contests, and so on. But I, what is I've been recently picking up um, Dr. Michael Crichton's writings again. Like, I think if anyone's taken the time to read, like, State of Fear or the original Jurassic Park or Rising Sun, uh, I mean, that was good, compelling fiction that was also very much a way to sort of tell the problem like it was in that time. And I mean, even in the late 90s, you know, or early 90s, you know, Mike, Michael Crichton got a lot of flack for writing Rising Sun. Uh, you know, to well, I mean, he, where... he took even he had even more problematic views later in his life. Oh yeah, uh, um, so, you know, uh, on the issue of like anthropomorphic or anthropomorphic yeah, yeah, very change. much. So. Yeah, I mean, he but... came to the same conclusions as Bjorn Lumberg or mm -hmm. or Judith Curry, which in my mind are not unreasonable conclusions, and perhaps the ones that I hold actually probably they are, right? Uh, but 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 I would say like not not like not so like but, but yeah, but but and... like this just just like a you know don't panic and all of a sudden you know he's canceled he would have been canceled if he hadn't died in something like 2010 he died yeah. i think in what 2004 uh, 2004 like, i thought it was later is that that early i, I think that's 2010 right 
Uh, here, I'm going to just double check. Yeah. But I mean, uh, he definitely died before things got really bad. He died before the Great Awakening. But yeah, he died. Okay, he, he died yeah. in 08. So he died. Oh, okay, right, okay. Yeah, yeah he happy. died right as like Obama like got elected. But I mean, uh, he didn't get to live to see the Great Awakening. He would have definitely. Oh, yeah, he would have been canceled. So would have, he would have been one of the, the those canceled writers for sure. But um, we don't. We, there's not a lot of. But there's not a lot of writers like that today. And I don't think that they can exist with sort of the intense you know, political gatekeeping that's out there. But I think that that's something that we need is that there isn't a lot of fiction that sort of details uh, the the monsters that walk among us. And maybe this is where I'll, I'll insert sort of my pet fiction that I like consuming. Um, I, I think one of the things that I think speaks a lot about analog horror in today's day and age for Zoomers and younger millennials is that there is uh, a technological component to it, but there's also the the, the teleology is still grounded. Like there is. Can, can another you cover what's analog horror? Oh exactly. sure, sure. So like it's basically a mix of found footage fiction and horror done in the second person, primarily using um, analog technology, so VHS sure. tapes, radio. Yeah. And, and, you'll, um, and you'll notice you'll notice that this you know found footage is in the classic tradition of epistolary horror, which yeah. you know was famous mm -hmm. what Dracula was right and but. For some reason, when we went from VHS tapes to YouTube videos, the horror kind of stopped. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. like, can, I, yeah, can, can, it can, really died after good Wreck YouTube. and um, the first, uh, what, what was the, uh, the series of movies with the security cameras? Paranormal the Activity. Yeah, Paranormal Paranormal activity. activity. And they died after that. Yeah. This was, uh, people thought it was a Blair Witch Project. It wasn't. It was Cannibal Holobunga that really started that genre off. Um I think it was the first found footage film. Basically. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, yeah. But I don't think there was anything else like that to a point where, you know, he gets charged with murder. But the, the reason why I think that that stuff kind of does a, a better job at naming the horrors that sort of walk among us is, is that a lot of the more popular ones that are out there, whether it's Gemini Home Entertainment or more famously The Back Rooms, is just... Yeah. Yeah. These things talk about shady deals that have been made with sort of the otherworldly or tapping into the otherworldly and the name of making life better. And, oh, by the way, we've unleashed horrors beyond our comprehension. Yeah. And I think that that's the closest thing that we have today, even in a fictional setting that sort of names the fact that in the name of managerial, uh, you know, leadership or governance to improve things. Like for instance, like Kane pixels on YouTube has made a whole story yeah, for, yeah. for the, for the back rooms. And the whole premise of it is we wanted to create a space for people to put all their shit in. And, um, Oh, by the way, total like, framing is like yeah, using the other it, world it, to inframe. It, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Basically just creating liminal spaces for people to put their shit in and for storage. And like, this will be the solution to all of the world's problems. And they create this liminal space tapping mm -hmm. into something. And oh, by the way, there are like otherworldly horrors that mimic human beings and it's terrifying. And that's kind of where we are today, where it's just like, oh, in the name of creating solutions to problems, we've created... Facts you know, still in of, yeah, we've created yeah. these hyper-real versions of human beings that like are just ever so slightly off. And, and sort of the way that we, we tell, you know, we have kids now being told in elementary schools that it's okay to, you know, castrate yourself and that you'll still be accepted. Yeah, but... Uh... I mean, the, the the missing element in all of this, I think that sort of Black Mirror, if, before Black Mirror got woke was another example of this being sort of a fertile ground for horror. But I think that, you know, in, insofar as, uh, I'm gonna kind of contradict myself here, portraying the monsters is, uh, I think that's gonna get easier, but portraying the heroism is going to be hard for a very long time. Yeah. I don't yeah. think the millennial generation is going to really understand heroism until they're in their like fifties or sixties. Like it, they have to, they have to get, cause like the millennials were born thinking they were heroes. And, and so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so like the thing is, is that if they, it's like Harry Potter, Harry Potter, he comes into this, Harry Potter is the like perfect millennial. Like he, he, he comes into Hogwarts school and I heard, I apologize for talking about Harry Potter on your podcast, but it's important to understand the millennial psychology. But like Harry Potter comes into Hogwarts school already being like a celebrity. People are yeah. like drinking toasts to his existence before he even knows that like he's the chosen one. And they still are doing that. And the people who aren't are like transparently evil. And like, you know, ontologically evil as the left puts it. Well, Ray, and, in the, I'm not a Star Trek, Star Wars fan, but Ray is kind of like that. Yeah, right? he's similar, similar, right? Similar, yeah, like this, yeah, like uh, chosen before they even did anything. And 
the thing is what's what kind of makes the Harry Potter uh, story weak, even though it kind of has moments of brilliance, the, the weak part about it is that Harry Potter just kind of lives at a narrative that was set for him and he never really challenges it at all. And it seems sort of almost like luck that, that he's walking this path and and it almost feels like, you know, the Malfoy family would be sort of a more interesting subject by the end. Uh, yeah. Like, how does their trajectory go? Like, it's not as clean. And, and you know, <laughs> and, um, uh, but but the, the thing is, is that the millennials, like, if they, if, if the millennials discover in their 30s that, like, they're the saviors of the world, first of all, that's transparently not true. Second of all, like, we've missed an important quality of actual heroism in the real world. And we're still in like fanfic land, yeah. like being self-indulgent through your entire life and then stumbling backwards into heroism by just kind of being not a bad person, like not being an asshole until you discover when you're 35, that you're the savior of the world. That's not like heroism. It, like humans understand that's not heroism. And when we see right. it depicted in people and, and like uh, JK Rowling, is it Rowling or whatever her name is? JK Rowling is a good enough author and she actually is a very brilliant like pace author and a good he's a brilliant understander of child psychology as well and that's why her her her, her novels are so I mean, they're they're actually quite compelling but uh you know but it is very much an adolescence view of heroism and and it's not an adult's view of heroism because heroism doesn't work like that in the real world and we're and the millennials are understanding this and the millennials are failing to confront this because they don't really have an archetypical language that describes anything else. And uh, so the millennials have to get through this period. They have to get to the point where they understand this lesson that, that the Harry Potter Ray arc is, is sort of false in a fundamental way. And social media is not helping that. And I'm one to talk, I know, but we had to kind of come to, we had to kind of come to the terms with the fact that this is uh, not what we're, we're destined for. And then, then we'll be able to actually find hints of heroism, like a real heroism in places we didn't think we'd find it. I think that the problem is, is that this fake shit's too loud for us. We can see the monsters because that's like everywhere, but, yeah. but the fake heroism and the fake self-congratulation and the fake compassion and the fake empathy means that all the real empathy and the real heroism just gets just lost in the noise somewhere, I guess, you know? Well, I think well, that's why there's such a love for like anti-hero characters or a lot of, um, uh, you know, through several layers of irony, they're somehow good or they were always the good guy in the end. I think that's why there's a lot of millennial and Zoomer affectation for Ryan Gosling characters or whatever character yeah. Ryan Reynolds is playing. Because they're not, I mean, we they're good in the essence that they identify to do things because there's character motivation, but they're not heroic because they undergo any meaningful transformation of their character. The character stays the same throughout the whole thing. Like Ryan Gosling and drive is the same person we saw at the beginning of the film as we do at the end, right? There isn't anything yeah. that would be the traditional Joseph Campbell heroes. The same thing as Deadpool. Yeah. Well, I, I like a counter example of that all this would be breaking bad where it's just, I think breaking bad is just a classic person becomes progressively more evil and is punished by God eventually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a little, but I think that's really my, very much the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that we'll get a lot of uh, Vince Gilligan style t television like that. I mean, Vince had already been yeah. working in the industry for 20 years at that point. I mean, he was well known at that time for what the X files as well. So mm, I, I just okay. think it'll be very hard for us to, to get something like that I, again. Cause I mean, even, I mean, the closest thing we get, believe it or not, is actually the spinoff better call Saul because it is, uh, cause he's a part of it. Him, uh, Vince Gould and Vince Gould and Vince Gilligan. It's basically just another repeat of, uh, you know, already shady character, like finalizes his, transition to evil despite being offered opportunities to be good and domestic and he chooses not to yeah yeah i mean that's i mean in some sense the millennials have been offered i mean i don't know this is always the problem is that uh it's hard to see how much millennials were offered the chance to be domestic and then turned it down and how much were they just never given a very good opportunity it will be an ambiguous thing, but very few of them are choosing the route towards domesticity and stability uh, to the extent that it even exists anymore. So I guess we'll see. 
Yeah, I really do think that maybe it is this like cultural generational narrative that we're sort of coming to the 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 the, the crescendo or climax of a Greek tragedy, wherein the character realizes the the fault or error of his ways, and I, I think the rejection of you know domesticity is definitely one of them. Like you had yeah. said, we're we're coming close to that psychological crisis very quickly. No, but I think that um, like you were saying about how the sort of the the death of the genuine hero overcoming. I think it's because the millennial. Uh, God, a Marna forums ruined that for me. Um, no, the thing because the millennials they sort we we've grown up in the end of history period. Or rather, we grew up in the brief period in which the end of history was possible. Uh, unless you lived, you know, in the 1990s, unless you were living in Eastern Europe or Africa. But that, that's besides the point. Um, and maybe even Asia for a little bit with the financial crisis. Um, but it's funny how we are the jump off generation and we have this sort of crushing, unrelenting nostalgia for our childhoods to the point where that hinders development. And I'm subject to this as well. I'm a big, uh, you know, I'm a big fish for millennial nostalgia, but I do think that this plays into what you were saying about the sort of the hero is someone who is already the subject of heroism rather than the recognition of achieving that heroism. Because we were born, we were sort of like the, um, the revolutionary generation to the, uh, the boomers, right? The yeah. liberals. And we were going to like, we were the placeholders of history. And we were going to be the revolutionary, uh, you know, z year zero. We, we were the one we yeah. were waiting for, right? We we're the ones we're waiting for. That's the ultimate yeah. millennial. Oh, slogan. God. Oh. Do you remember that from Obama? That's, yeah, we were the ones. Who were, no, but Obama. narcissism, the brand. Yeah, a lot of millennials, that's when they first voted was for Obama. Like that was the, yeah. you know, history was solved. Uh, racial, uh, you know, prejudice and equality was solved. Uh, we, we all know that's a lie, though. Of course, he was the most racially divisive president in human history besides, uh, well, maybe besides creep, uh, creepy Brandon, but uh, it's, it, it's funny how the position of millennials and its uniqueness influenced this sort of destruction of very ancient archetypal forms. The hero's journey always implies that you start off as not the hero, you know, you know, unless, unless you're doing something very literarily interesting, like how um, Herman Hesse inverted the uh, Gautama Buddha story by saying that, you know, the Buddha started off as an ascetic and then he became rich and then he went back to it. Like, unless you're doing something like that, but that's, you know, incredibly unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, even now, like even the beloved, uh, like I mentioned, Star Wars, the bull, I mean, Star Trek is different because Star Trek court sort of like had that to begin with. Right. But, uh, you know, all the problems were solved, but I, I noticed that um, even looking at the literature that's presented in the literary industry, I mean, largely run by millennial largely uh, white or largely white presenting women uh mfa grads writing books for other mfa grads i mean it's just the even romance itself even drama has become subject to this where the frictions and the problems they they're they're there but not really they're not there in a meaningful sense very you know i yeah I, if you know what i mean it's like no yeah, yeah. a lot of mfa literature is kind of like that um, they well, don't this happened first with poetry, right? I mean, yeah. you, it really wasn't, I don't really remember this back in the days of like David Foster Wallace, because I, I do remember books coming out that were substantial, like everyone had to read these books. Yeah. And they weren't just like dumb young adult fiction. Although when you get to things like Cloud Atlas, sort of in the mid 2000s, uh, you're, you're kind of straddling the line between serious adult fiction and, you know, uh, young adult fiction. But uh, even in the 2000s, though, and I, I know that Yarvin had a very famous uh, essay on this in his old blog, Unqualified Reservations, you could see that poetry had just died. It had become this repeating loop where poets would pretend to read each other's poetry and then give each other awards based on endowments given from them by institutions that themselves never read poetry, but just wanted to be seen as people who read poetry. They wanted to be like, oh, I'm a kind of person who reads poetry. And they didn't like, they didn't read it. They didn't speak it. It wasn't part of their daily routine. They just wanted to be part of this thing. They wanted to be a part of this class. And so the whole thing was just this self-referential loop. Yeah. And, and the thing is, um, you mentioned how, um, about this, yeah, it's very funny because the young adult literature thing to me is the embodiment. I think of 
not just millennial culture, but even um, you could call it American cultural obsessions as well, because it's the worship of adolescence. It's when you have the time in your life where you're experimenting with adult themes, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. but you don't have the responsibility of an adult. This is why our culture worships adolescence. Um, it's also but, the time of maximum autonomy as well. Yes, exactly. exactly. It's, it's the time in your life where you do possess maximum autonomy. And I noticed that young adult literature has become the vector of like ideology more than anything else, more than any other form. I mean, apart from even poetry cannot like, uh, sustain itself apart from like slam poetry rupee core or whatever like it's still young adult literature seems to be king nowadays i don't know it's, yeah well i mean it's just because it was what sells to the millennial nostalgia complex mm -hmm. and uh, millennials believe that the future is too bleak i mean it would, it would be it, can you imagine like a, a i don't know for, first of all to describe the world as it is can, can you imagine sort of a story about uh, sort of an intact heterosexual family dealing with the modern world? Like, mm -hmm. what, would it what would it take for that thing to be interesting and challenging? Like, it, it just seems to, like, it seems like it would basically have to be reactionary in some serious way. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm not saying that it, I, if I were to write that, I would be too tempted to include sort of on the nose political messaging. But even without that, it's the, 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 the struggles that actual real people have to deal with in this world are kind of hard to talk about in a way that is at all kind of comforting about the future. Uh, yeah. What we have is this, we don't really even have a society anymore. We have all these various different political groups that, uh, that they, they can only imagine living together in the bleakest of circumstances. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, they, and, and that all their dreams involve a certain amount of separation and autonomy. Uh, and, uh, now, the, the same thing is true for all, all of these. You, you see the sort of diverse, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, like the, all, all these new, I haven't really read a lot of these authors that they're publishing, but the, the ones that come from immigrant grant perspectives. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of work to cover up the fact. Um, I, there's a few books like this that I read when they were popular in the 2000s. But you, you, like a typical one would be like, a typical British novel of the genre would be like, Indian family comes to Britain. But like there, there would be an incredible amount of work done to cover Canada the fact that their, is full of this. their motivation yeah. is like really mercenary, right? Like yeah. it's it's either it's either traditionalist or it's mercenary, and both of the, those realities scare them, right? Like they, they they can't come out and say like our family's dream is to carve out an empire for like Sikh people inside the nation of Britain. And like and, and and rule it as Sikh people like that that's like that would actually make their soul sing I think right yeah and yeah. and it actually you know, like we're going to be Swiss Family Robinson except as opposed to conquering like Polynesians we're going to be conquering Anglos <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, no I mean like I, and like that would actually you know I mean first of all it's more honest what what how they see themselves and yeah. and yeah. secondly. It, it's uh, I, I don't think it's ennoble from their point of view, but it, but it, but it would kind of give the game away. It would make the the white. Uh, first of all, it would make. It, if, I, I can tell you the emotions that it would it would send through the 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 um because this is sort of embodies. It, I, I, I'm gonna kind of um take myself back here. I don't want to hijack your show, but uh, <laughs> the the um you know this is sort of a transition I made from progressivism to uh to. So I was a progressive for a brief period in between high school libertarianism and 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 sort of conservatism and neo reaction and and Catholicism, uh, some combination of those three things. And um, you know, but but all the while when I was this new atheist, I kind of felt this threat of Islam. And so I would always sort of sample from sort of the you, know, you remember the anti Islam web like in two thousand. Yeah, like yeah. jihad watch and all this stupid. Oh yeah, Condell is like oh my god, yeah. it's just like you know. And, <laughs> Ezra Spencer was big enough. I think Robert Spencer's career was killed by Richard Spencer because everyone confuses him now. So, no, no, I don't. I don't dislike. I don't dislike African Americans. I just dislike Muslims. <laughs> I'm the good one, right? <laughs> um, you know, but 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 even you know, but 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 the thing is, is that the 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 reaction that goes through the progressive imagination, uh, if they were to acknowledge the imperious ambitions of the immigrants, is once you see. Uh, that that you know that that there are people in this world who just want to like rule and they want to thrive and they want to conquer 
the, the two the reactions that, that the liberal mind has is the first one is disgust and reversion and security threat. Yeah. And, and, and so this, way. yeah, exactly. And it's, so, and that's fine. You know, obviously that's, that's like the daily bread of if it, as long as that security threat has a white face, then we're still very much on the reservation as far as progressives concerned. But as soon as that comes in front of a, uh, you know, the, the awful women in front with, with a, with a black or brown face, then suddenly it's, it's discussed reversion. And then sort of you kind of get past that and you kind of empathize with your enemy, like real empathy, not the fake stuff that fake shit that progressives do. Yeah. And you understand that like their desire to conquer you is like, it might be wrong, but like, it's also kind of like noble and human and mm -hmm. visceral and alive and, and something that like humans do and always have done. And like, what the shit are you doing sitting here, here like talking about the next consumer product? Like once you realize, like how sympathetic can you feel for the, the security and defense of people who can't even be bothered to stop playing video games, uh, consuming pornography or not having gay orgies to save themselves from existential disaster? Like yeah, not very much, right? Really with the white nationalists for saying that though. Well, yeah, but like, yeah, but like, that's like, get, I guess you love white nationalism too. And like, you realize that you, you realize that, 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 that your desire is for something that's real and collective right, and visceral. Right. And you're looking for how you can participate in this thing that's alive, not, not, not participate, not, not be the, the victim of them, certainly, but at the same time, you know, not be not the victim of them, and then find yourself into some kind of hermetically sealed hug box that that robs you of all humanity and and life that you can see them experiencing in their own ambitions. Right. So, so what's so funny about this whole market for for non-white authors is that they have to, they literally have to obscure the most vital parts of their own existences. And the other half of their existences, if they were honest, would be a certain sort of traditional devotion. Uh, you know, most Hindu households and most Muslim households and most African households are supremely religiously devoted. Now, the people that they put up in front uh, to speak for the community the tend to be atheists. Right? Yeah. They're the most secular versions, right? Um, but, but then, like, you know, you know, what you're seeing in this fiction is you're saying there there actually could be probably a lot of interesting literature coming from non-white communities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but the thing is that the 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 the, the publishers, Joe's Carol Oates, complains about not entertaining interesting young white authors. Uh, they're not entertaining like the most interesting stories coming out of non-white communities. They're, they're picking like the most uninteresting, sterilized. Yeah. Like they, they they've cut off like the, the two most visceral elements of the non-white experience, as far as I can tell, is, is the ambitious feeling of conquering and creating a thriving life for yourself that you could never have accomplished in your own country. And a large part of that is 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 demonstrating to to people who formerly were in charge of the world that you're in charge now and then the other half is establishing your own traditions and your own devout religious belief and yeah and and coming a part of of sort of the soullessness of the corporate world itself and like without those two ambitions like you what you what do you have you have like proto-feminist brown women who are excited about like oh jobbies <laughs> yeah exactly like they're excited about like marginally moving up the managerial ladder like no one's interested in that and even if they were they, that person wouldn't be a very interesting person to other people because well, yeah. the only visceral moment in that moment <laughs> is narcissism the professional art world is the same way by the, the in fine arts is that Deanna Hobbes was saying this years ago where that like they promote you, you have to market yourself as the post-colonial mm. artist as is the relation to the white majoritarian, whereas you're not marketing your own unique identity and religion and so forth, but sorry, Prudential, I cut you off. Oh, no, no, you were fine. What I was going to say though, is that like, even when they try to do slice of life television, like you, it, it would, it, when they try to do it right, it's always innately poisoned for some aspect of conquering or to just tell you that, they will not leave you alone. Like I think about the, there are two, sh there are three shows that come to mind about this. One was uh, Parenthood when it was still running on the air. Like there was oh, that God. great arc with like their teenage girl, like, you know, falling in love with like the Michael B. Jordan character who was emancipated and like came from a bad home. And it's just like, it's this uh, insertion of just like sort of the progressive, like, well, we have to understand the plight of the black community in order to do so. Um, and then, of course, there's um, This Is Us, which I think is still on the air. Oh, Maybe it just God. concluded, oh, which is one man. of the worst shows I've ever I've, I've watched. 
My mom used to watch that. But then the third one that perfectly explains sort of that like conquering sensation. I think Canada has it worse with like Little Mosque on the Prairie. Little Mosque on the Prairie. But like in America, I know the Muslims are totally deracinated. Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're like they're like. Have you ever met Muslims like that? They're just like they're like the 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 versions of Muslims that progressives would like, and they're we like Islam. They're not really Muslims. They're just boring. But I mean, even in America, right? There's that like rom com sort of sitcom family, like Bob loves Abishola or whatever. Oh yeah, with the guy from the best yeah, with like some regular, yeah. like the guy that looks like a working Joe, like the mustache looks like he like works a bus in Queens or something, and he's in love with this like black African woman. I don't know which country that she's from, but it's just basically like grafting the African immigrant experience to just like the white working class and how they have to. Um, instead of rather than try to get them to assimilate, they just have to be a part of it. And like that, the, the inner narrative of just like, yeah, does we have he to wear the kufi after a while? Does he wear the kufi? I <laughs> couldn't tell you. <laughs> I really couldn't. But I mean, That'd that's, that's basically just where it is. Is is that, um, and, and, you know, the, they're, they're doing the, the self hate, right. The, the secular, um, avatars for these people. While, you know, they, they might hate themselves for being, you know, where they came from in order to be with the in crowd, but they're sort of invading and very much conquering the space of where they are now. And I think the television has been a good example of that. And when they do talk about like native or domestic struggles, I think about the American remake of Shameless, where it's just mm-hmm. like degenerate oh, yeah. misery porn of like poor whites in Chicago. I mean, there's never been a, a good way to give us a hero or give, um, anything there it has to be transgressive at all times to what we would consider to be normal or traditional but in the like future they... only eunuchs of various kinds will be allowed on television yeah because yeah. the portrayal of any person black white or brown that has actual desire to thrive as a living human being will be so threatening to the system and, and its narrative that it, it will be sort of anathema yeah, that's cool. like Perfume Nationalist said. Like every black person on TV has to be like Donald Glover, like a sort of metrosexual. You know, like it's even like the vision of I've said this for a while. Like the vision of um, millennial dystopia or apocalypse is tainted by the current order. Like The Walking Dead is the perfect example. Like do you, like okay, here's the thing. I know this is gonna sound kind of uh, sound kind of off. Okay, so forgive me for this. But do you think? In the future, mm-hmm. after zombie apocalypse, <laughs> do you think that there will be reproductive age women who are choosing to be lesbians? Do you no. think that's going to happen? Yeah, like, there can't. Right? The, yeah, that's that's. I'm not implying anything. I'm not implying anything. Just that, that's one example. I mean, maybe if they were insane, right? But the, right, right. like, if you're if you're talking about, I mean, this is Edward. This is Edward Dutton said this and. It's it's stupid to imagine this handmaiden's tale where like these these reproductive age women are are just kept as like this low values of society. Like it, if there were a s- small class of women in their twenties and thirties that had reproductive capacities and no one else did, those women would be worth their weight in gold, and they would be I mean they would be royalty and they'd be married to the richest men and they would be served on by other. They would not be served. They would not be handmaids. They would have handmaids. And and uh, and they would be pampered, and they would understand. I mean, in, in some sense, like this is also true. Uh, their their uh, power as you know reproductive women would would come from how many children they had. So if you were a reproductive yeah. age woman with two children, I mean, you'd probably be high status. But a reproductive woman with twenty children would be like a queen, because all of her young sons would be loyal to her, right? Because the woman you came from as a son would be incredibly important, and this would form up. I mean, there might be a little bit longhousey in the the oh, bad conception of things, yeah. but but still, like you know, finding age men or finding age men, and you know, this this is this it, this couldn't exist this way, right? The, 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 there there would be a visceral draw uh, in in this situation where reproduction was of such a high capacity towards the feminine, right. just in the way that there would be a reproductive draw towards the masculine. It's sort of funny when you say Donald Glover because you know he was sort of this metrosexual black man, but. At the same time, like the 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 music video that sort of made him really really famous yeah, for a while was like this is America, which is like 
has this like really visceral heart of darkness kind of like animalistic energy to it that was like it struck me as like totally inappropriate from a progressive point of oh, view man, if you took the aesthetic seriously yeah, yeah yeah i mean like it, uh, the only reason why that they uh that this is like it's sanitized because like if you read into it like there's 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 all these these very very problematic aspects to this right oh yeah um this is like it's sort of in the in the mode we are in now it, it's sort of like it, homosexual culture would be in the 1920s uh, there's a little bit of it, you know, as right wingers, but most of it is just reading innuendo into things that have subtext. And um, oh my and, god, do, do you know my friend Pill Eater? Yeah, um, he sounds familiar. It, but yeah, he calls it queer culture. That's what basically the right wing um, has adopted, like in the academic sense, queer. Yeah. As like you know, you know the academic term, right? Not the James Lindsay butchering of it, but you know the actual academic term. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a lot of right wing culture now is basically kind of like queer culture of that era. And it's like, that's really fat. I know he pisses everyone off when he says that, but it's true. You could see it like this sort of outsider um, creating this like online Creole language to evade censorship. Well, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, I, I know uh, Dave knows this from the from, from the event that we had in February, but basically a lot of the what, you, what you're calling a Creole language. Like, I mean, in the queer context, a lot of like right wing language with innuendo or dog whistle, it's just yeah. right wing Polari. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because now, like, <laughs> even mainstream people know, like, LGBTQ terminology. Mainstream people know what bottoming is. You know, like, they know what... And not only that, is. corporations make, like, snack corporations make, yeah. you yeah. know, advertisements for how the, bo the bottom diet, <laughs> which is, like, you know, this, this ruins their signal. But, I mean, this is what... But, I mean, in addition to us, like, me and Magic is the preliminary... Uh, well, it's not the preliminary. I say it's sort of the intermediate stage of developing a right-wing language yeah. that it, that sort of evades authorities and communicates core concepts and all this stuff. And as you've noticed, almost all persistent memes are right-wing memes. They begin their lives like the Chad. Yes, you like yeah. left-wingers use that now, like they, oh, like they use that oh, frequently God. now, right? And oh, so, oh, but this is that. it makes no sense because like the, so the Chad guy is like that's the symbol of the left winger now, <laughs> and, you know. You know the the, yeah. the Wojaks don't even really make very much sense, and and so um, but 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 beyond that, it, it, beyond just like the, the the fact that we're getting a rudimentary development of symbi symbolism, and and uh, the, the the rudimentary development of of language that identifies you as a right winger or yeah. as a wrong thinker, uh, you uh, you can also have a fun time, and I do this all the time, um, like. Artists, when they describe reality, describe right-wing themes, they have to in order for it to be real and honest. And so when you have someone like really trying hard to be um, artistic, like ContraPoints, Ad Lewin, uh, they end up making films that are right-wing, like have right-wing messaging. Uh, obviously, like they don't mean, they, they, they don't mean, they don't mean this, but yeah. do they? I mean, like the, the last, all the narrative films of ContraPoints are basically, them. like if you read the subtext, the way that, you know, queer theorists read, read mainstream movies from like the 50s or yeah. 40s yeah like in, insofar as like all of those like films about gladiators in the 1950s had homosexual subtexts all yeah. contrapoints videos have right-wing subtexts like massive right-wing subtexts how and they, so, give me an example though give me an example okay, okay so the last contrapoints video the hunger it, it's like first of all it's like a complete caricature of a right-wing person debating a left-wing person on on a, on, a, on a fictional like an a fictional an a fictional merger between david rubin and robin millennial uh that like an a fictional podcast that never exists where we're far right or we're we're somehow right-wingers from 1985 who have been zapped into the present they, <laughs> you know, modern trans people like contrapoints uh but they they, they 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 have this conversation about homosexuality and desire and controlling desire and, and all this stuff, and uh, and then the desire for self destruction, and then uh, oh my god, I don't know what conclusion they come to, but like the conclusion that 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 the the main character, the contrapoint self insert character is, is well, you know, I, I it turns out I don't have any ultimate meaning, so uh, in order for me not to feel the pain of my own nihilism, I'm going to get recreationally addicted to drugs, and now I can't get out, out of this cycle, right? And that's the conclusion of the video. The conclusion of the video is I don't have any good answers for the quest of meaning. They're put to me by this Christian. 
Uh, like certain developments in my own life, like the the stand in is this utterly ridiculous idea that she had this crush on like this furry le like trans lesbian or whatever, which is obviously fictional. But yeah. the, but the real thing is my life didn't turn out personally the way I wanted to. I don't have any l larger telos for my own existence, and and to fill the void, I need to put something in there, and that's drugs. And now I'm in a vicious cycle that's only going downward. Ketamine, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, like ketamine, or I don't know what the stand-in drug, but something like that, right? Uh, and um, and like, what what's the message to that? Like that, the message to that is is that like this is a bad path, don't go down it. But it's the one that naturally is led to by progressivism. Uh, I mean, it's as homo it's it, 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 it's it's right wing in the same way that like you know a bunch of like muscly men like greasing each other up in a gladiator movie in the 1950s as a homoerotic undertone. You know? Oh my god, that's oh that blows my mind. I mean, maybe your conversation with Natalie maybe influenced uh, him, her. Uh, uh, let's create. Like, well, I think the real one that bro broke their mind was the Blair White. Uh, oh yeah, yeah that's yeah. the one that that, that yeah. they never got over that one. They, yeah, never, they never got over yeah, that one. Yeah, uh, no, but, but that's crazy though. Like, I I think that confronting the nihilistic despair of the leftist worldview is like like not even like a great writer like zero hp lovecraft could probably like pull that off the way that someone who's in it can you, yeah. you know i mean i i think that um probably like philosophy tube does like more of a quote-unquote earnest leftist take on it than natalie but it's that's oh. amazing i didn't know this it's also her. transparently a grit like philosophy yeah, tube yeah. like nothing there's nothing real in a philosophy tube video uh, what, Nothing what, real about philosophy tube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Every, everything's like a copy. You know, like. Yeah, it's like it's like, and then, but but Natalie when wants to put themselves in the video in a real way. Yeah. Uh, and so every one of the videos is like a desire to walk the tightrope between okay, I need to tell the truth about myself and where I am, and right. I need to respect leftist orthodoxy, which is like, you know, it's it's a brilliant uh, character study, but just not in the way they want it. <laughs> It really is the tightrope walker in uh, in Zarathustra. It's like Natalie's walking. Yeah, the yeah, and, and it's <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Natalie is the true Zarathustrian uh, will to power. Um, <laughs> I know Logo Dallas thinks that the left has the true will to power, but like it's in some ways I may I disagree, but in some ways like you you said this one line. Um, I, I would put it different. I would put let the left has the true will to death. Yes, and, 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 yeah. and the will, and, and right, and right, and right now, the yeah. the will to death is the most real desire people are experiencing, because the will to life has to cross this chasm of prohibit exactly. of, of prohibitive hardship that millennials can't can, were never raised to conceptualize, 100%. and therefore the will to death is just like that's the authentic desire. In it's the, the oceanic day. feeling. It's complete. Yeah. Right? Exactly, and that's, that's why Yukio Mishima is the right-wing author that best embodies our moments. Uh, I don't think, like, I, I think this is a transitory moment. I think that life will be rediscovered at the end. Mm -hmm. But, like, the people who choose life over death are going to have to sort of answer. The, 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 their, their main contention is going to be the, the, the true will to death, not the true will to power. Exactly. Have you have you ever read Mbebi's um, Necropolitics? You read that book? I have not. No. <laughs> that well, it's pretty popular. Um, and I think Mbebi, his head would spin, um, being like the the sort of forebearer of Foucault. Um, who again to uh, Michel Foucault being an author, I've devoted too much time to, mm -hmm. um, in grad school. Uh, but Mbebi talks about like the sort of capacity for death. He takes on a gambit in Foucault. He talks about like sort of the sort of mediation of death among certain populations. But when you really think of it, I know this will make his head spin. A lot of like leftoid politics basically is necropolitics. Yeah. A lot of it, most of it actually, because it has that sort of all pervasive, um, cordoning off certain elements of life into the auspices of death in a way that cannot be reproduced by any sort of like authentic essentialist politics you'd find in the political career. even though he's saying that he says that well the right wing always has the politics of death because they want to condemn xyz immigrant xyz like you know chilean right wing happy squad that's for youtube purposes um <laughs> you know right wing happy squad uh but really the actual true necropolitics is what we're seeing now and we're seeing in this sort of uh sort of the secular religiosity around it and sort of the aestheticization of it. Um, and in the fact that Natalie can be honest about it, like, I think that it's really 
we're living in very, you know, I know it's a cliche, but it's true. We are living in spiritual warfare. Um, and, uh, but anyways, I, I, I wanted to move on to some criticisms I had of certain videos, but Prude, you go out, you, you see your, Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, but, yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things that also came to mind is this little, I mean, like the, the contra points video, I think is also like a rare moment. It's a confession more than anything else. Mm. Right. Cause of the ending, yeah. but um, it also sort of reiterates that like they have to find themselves with the Harry Potters or to be the hero at the start, whether they know it or not, everything's been foretold because I think, yeah, I mean, you write what you know. And I mean, one of the things that I think causes a lot of like intergenerational spats between millennials, boomers, uh, and what I think will eventually become Gen X and Zoomers is um, this, like just the uh, narrative that they were like given when they were socialized as children, that like you are special you have the capacity to be, and like, this is what boomers complain about when it says like, you know, participation trophies or whatever. But like the, the kernel of truth in there is that the millennial narrative for a lot of people was to grow up, that you were going to change the world, that you were the generation in waiting. And yeah. so mm -hmm. when that turns out to be false and there's now this pit of despair. And I think what you had mentioned in your sunset stream, this coming psychological crises, I think we're going to see a lot more content from people like, you know, from whatever is going to be the future of bread tube is going to be, that kind of oh you know the, the life that i was sold was not necessarily true and place similar... your bets who's gonna snap first <laughs> you know? yeah right just Vander hall cuck philosophy um <laughs> maybe cuck, cuck philosophy is a good guy he's yeah, not he's... particularly self-aware though yeah um but, but i think know. that the, i think that that's what's going to come because i think we're already beginning to see it uh, the, the two biggest things that we see a lot of millennials consume, at least in a literary sense, is young adult fiction, because I think it reiterates the narrative for them that they are heroes. But then secondly is uh, self-help books. Self-help has been totally taken away from any sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If I were to walk into a Barnes & Noble right now and go to like the self-help or like mental health section, there's like four or five books that all have I'm the same sort life. of title of like how not to be a useless fuck, right? Like it's the same thing. <laughs> Um, over and over and over again. And that's more or less what it, it, it's going to be, I think, in a lot of ways for the, for the future. Um, but maybe in a weird optimistic sense, like what we might see for heroism in, in the future is that um, there's a, you know, we, we've just come out of two long-term 20-year sort of engagements in the Middle East. There are a lot yeah. of guys that are going to, to be writing. I think we, we will see a lot, I think a lot more politically charged Tim O'Brien's of the world than we will yeah. um, uh, then say, you know, the things they carried, which of course Vietnam has its own cultural impetus, but yeah. I think the, the post wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we will see sort of a, a very real interpretation of what the hero might be what? from those that know sacrifice a little different than the average person. But another thing too, is that we're forgetting is that to bring it back to the work of art, even bring it back to a sort of a spiritual engagement with the world. Um, there are currently moves being made by the quote unquote enemies of America that are like making serious moves in the Middle East and Africa. Two big countries that you know the big countries, right? Yeah. China and Russia, right? So they are talking in terms of multipolarity. They have very different aesthetic, cultural, and philosophic and even spiritual engagements in what they're thinking than we do. And so that's another massive part. The Russians, for example, have the most amount of ateliers in all of Europe, apart from London, of course. Um, and that's going to probably be something they have. Certainly, if you read people like um, the one philosopher we're all familiar with, uh, they truly, you know, they think of it, well, at least he thinks of it in terms of spiritual warfare. I mean, whether there's validity to that, whether he's just you know, maybe saying that for propaganda reasons, but this is a serious thing. Like, they're, you know, the fact that you know, Putin and, and uh, as I've said before, Putin and Xi Ping, the fact that they call each other every week and Biden does not call Xi Ping every week. And in America, you know, China is probably America's biggest trading party, right, Prude? I mean, is that true? Or, uh, yeah. 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 So it's like, um, th that's another aspect. But, you know, you were talking about, um, what was I going to say? Uh, you were talking about sort of the, the, the role of like uh, the, the bread tuber, the millennial anxiety, um, the sort of particular anxieties that we're facing, the fact that uh, we have to deal with like the digital reality that we're living in, the fact that the exposure to content. I mean, if you want to talk about like the sort of 19th century um, the existentialist crisis of the century with anxiety and and we like that's like I can't envision what's going to happen, especially 
when you have these other externalized political and cultural forces that are threatening the sort of um, the sort of hegemony of the GAE uh, cultural expansion, right? Like that's the fact that certain powers are willing to question like mass consumertocracy is like, you know, not even people in like 1999 could envision that when they were like protesting the W the WTO, you know, like, I mean, that's, I, we truly thought that, that was here forever. Like, but multipolarity mm. is, will present its own challenges. I don't know, Prude, you're shaking your head. You don't think that's Well, gonna, so I, yeah. this is the running theory that I will, history will have to test, but um, you know, it, I, my thought process, and I told this on blood satellite to dimes was that, mm. You know, China's reacting in a way to sort of the shit lib cultural exports that America puts out. They're like, yeah. you know, no effeminate pop stars, video game time will be limited. We want like really masculine role models, none of this furry, your, your basic G degeneracy stuff. But at the same time, they're still sending their youth, their uh, their, their future elite class within the, the Politburo. They're still sending them to American yeah. universities, the, the epicenter uh, of, of, of shit liberty, right? These, the, the, of the cultural and academic exports for it. And so um, I just think to myself, like, is this a reaction uh, where they're trying to like, you know, take prep before the, the cultural pause gets to them? Or is it too late? Or is it too late? Or is it too late and the viral load is above zero and therefore they're, yeah. it's transmitted to them? Prep that's is my, not 100%. That's my, that's my, that's my theory that I, I'm running that will, only history will really tell, I think, in due time. I, yeah. If I'm, if I'm right, then cool. Like China's going to get really weird really quickly. But if not, then um the, the the true multipolarity will will definitely continue to go on but yeah um but anyways the the article itself the the heart reset i know geo you had some things that you wanted to, mm -hmm. to ask away yeah um i won't know it was that article but all like well first of all the one statement you made in the stream um and even in the article about the uh and we cover the destruction of culture. You said like, we don't get mad about these things. Cause really it's like their cultural moment. We're just living in it. We're occupying it. Yeah. And that in itself is like a form of a necropolitics because we have been consigned, maybe not in, well, maybe physically we'll, we'll see what happens if things get really weird and uh, terrible, but uh, certainly culturally and uh, in terms of online discourse, in terms of sort of like the abandonment of, um, the sort of free and open territory of the internet. There's certainly a necropolitics going on in the way that dissidents are treated. But one criticism I have, and um, I wanted to, this was a video you did a few months ago mm -hmm. uh, before your break. You did this video about lore and creating counter um, dissident art. And you had this very, um, very technical, very like engineer brain yeah. approach <laughs> And I, I remember watching my good friend Matthew the Stout that I know we talked to him. Uh, you're, you're familiar with Matthew, right? I think we talked about uh, Yeah, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, it's, I probably know them by their online title somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We Well, we were talking about your video and, and um, I, I was sort of, I'm critical of it because I don't think that you can create genuine art, artistic expression and culture through solving it as an engineering problem, through gatekeeping it like the way that certain fandoms are gatekeeped, the way certain online movements are gatekeeped. I think that to me, it just comes off as too like engineer brain. Like it's that was way, very that was a very engineer brain Substack essay. I yeah. kind of think I was pure folly writing that. Like yeah. I was just I was so into this idea that oh, like, we seem to solve the right wing art problem. We see to solve it. And then I think it was, I don't think all of the ideas were necessarily bad. No, no, it's because a corpse is a great way to get your creative juices flowing. But I think the idea of collectively producing art is um, more. You were that, sure. yeah, that, uh, that has to, that can't be geek brain so cutely. Right, right. And, you know, before you have to walk before you run. And right now what we're trying to do is just, we're, we're trying to come to some kind of very real interaction with the world we actually live in. Yes. Just kind of yes. take stock of it and just move from there. And, and for me, th like for me, it's been sort of the smaller things. It's been sort of like the poetry and, mm -hmm. and, and just sort of, just sort of the very small pieces of art that have seemed the most meaningful. And then, uh, you know, I think we might, maybe we'll see sort of short stories like H zero HP Lovecraft could be the first iteration of people like that. 
but yeah 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 there's even people like um that, that are doing novels and are being self-published or there's publishing houses i recently did um a woodcut for someone who wanted a uh, book cover and it was the first time i ever did a border with woodcut so if you can see that let, let's see here you go if you can see it yeah there you go. There you go. I gotta see this. Ah, oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um. He wanted a, a electric plug in the eye socket. He is doing something to do with the novel. I I don't question. I don't <laughs> question. But uh, no. But I I think that um, the, the sort of, I think approaching it in that s sense, the sort of gatekeeping and the petty disagreements people have and the sort of spirit of a movement. It comes about organically. I mean, if you examine the great art movements of the past, I mean, this is um. This, I mentioned secessionists, um, even to an extent, the New York school um, had a variety of different influences coming from Europe, from the old world into the new. Uh, Urshal Gorky basically transporting his own unique theosophic uh, Rosicrucianism there. Um, it's And I feel like um, so that I, but I'm glad that you recognize the criticism of that, because I feel like we're too um, in the mire to sort of think about these things as an engineering problem and i don't think that organic um or like an organic artistic um aesthetic avant-garde um uh, the way that it comes about i mean even the greatest movements in the contemporary right wing in what i call the e-right i mean frog twitter that came out of um mm. people moving on from forums onto onto uh what does bap call it twatter and, you know, I was there for it, and uh, it it's became about organically. Another observation I had was, I said to Prude, was um, you were talking about how um, the alt-right started off as sort of an avant-garde. Yeah. Sort of like, you know, um, you know Andrew England getting uh, Pizza Hut to denounce uh, white nationalism. But then, you know, certain people like the hairdo came about and const reconstituted it as first a political movement, then as infotainment. And therefore all of those sort of clever and like, you know, funny, um, you, for example, the, the music edits that people like Meraku and Walt Bismarck used to do, like that mm. stuff became kind of hokey and, you know, even Fashion Wave to an extent had its heyday. Now, but, you know, well, what is this video doing to help us save the West? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that comment, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. It's just like, well, it's a funny video, dude. You know, just get over yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, it's at that point where, like, it, we became our own version of the of the Stone Toss comic about burgers, you know. <laughs> burgers, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the West, you know. <laughs> the West, yeah. No, but but that's what I mean. I think that um, there there was. I mean, there's still promises. There's still people doing interesting things. Like my friend. Um, my friend uh, Dave, you know, the Bizarre archives are doing, you know, pulp mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, it's, you know, I think that the pro like you were saying, we're in its infancy stage. And um, I, I just, again, I do not feel comfortable with the journalists and the academics so far, thus far coming in. I mean, even, I mean, I know I'm friends with a lot of them. I'm friends with a lot of these post left people who are interested in more cultural output, but it's just, um, I, I don't think that they can handle a lot of the different uh, nuances of like, even like the, the articles that were published in I am 1776's book, which I'm very much a part of. Um, a lot of these academics were talking about why is it that people like these people care about posting one and other art forms? Well, because the reality is, is that a lot of the right current E right is basically predicated upon posting and meme culture. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's the back, like you could say whatever you want about the YouTubers, say I've already wanted about live streaming, but the real backbone of it is posters at the end of the day. And it's yeah. and it, you know, for 10 years, it's been that way. And uh, I don't know what that can turn into. There has been people, you know, I'm friends with like, you know, like Zero HP Lovecraft who have turned posting into an actual literary career, but I don't think you can easily transition posting thus far into the alchemy of what we would approach as being fine art or even illustration. I'm, I'm actually hoping literary. Substack change. I mean, I do appreciate a good beam. I do appreciate linguistically what that's done for us. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, ultimately we need to kind of get past this. I'm hoping Substack is our first step at least. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I know, yeah, because I think the poster has to confront long form content in different ways that, you know, and, that, and that's the thing, like even, because a lot of these cultural artifacts are sort of like dead, like forum culture, unfortunately. I mean, there's certain sites that are trying to revive it, but I mean, it's just, uh, 
that mode of expression had vitality, had ideas, had expression. But unfortunately, I think po like the forum sort of culture is largely an affectation of the past. Forum culture was devoured by Reddit, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. And you can really see the evolution of it. This is, I mean, Curtis Irvin talks about this all the time. It's actually, but it is interesting, right? Because it, forum culture started from places sort of like Usenet, and then it evolved mm -hmm. into sort of like literal forums, right? And um, the, the the whole idea was selectivity. Yes. But then Reddit blew that up, and Reddit became sort of, it turned selectivity into like a game of lowest common denominator. And then, you know, you get, you, you literally get the, the phenomenon of the Redditor. Do you, I don't mean, know, you guys are younger than me. Do you remember when yet Reddit was like cool? Well, somewhat. Yeah. Like, and, but like it, but there was this time when it was like, you know, people with actually interesting ideas and, you know, it wasn't just for like the, the, I mean, there's this stereotype of Redditors now that are just, it's just absolutely degenerate. And, yeah. and it's true to life. But there was a time when you know you could you could be challenged by something you found on Reddit. And yeah, Reddit had a lot of niche areas where you could find interesting things. Like the yeah. science fiction is was one of them. There was this. They, it's still on there, but it's gotten progressively worse with its moderation rules. But it was like it's called uh, HFY, like humanity, fuck yeah, where it was like we can tell science fiction stories with like a, a triumphalist human perspective. Um, and niche, uh, you know, ideologies had places too before the Great Awakening. And yeah, but I mean, it, but the thing is, is that Reddit is also infected other places. Like, there's huge swaths of like, if I were to go on B right now on 4chan, where people are posting in a way where they know it'll get screenshotted and be posted to r slash 4chan on Reddit, um, where people will even be like, "Include me in the screenshot, bro." You know, like it's <laughs> yeah, a it's lot of that's master turfed as well. It, it's it's yeah. definitely changed the way there, which is still sad because you can get some of the best international relations news on, and goings on from uh, from 4chan still these days. But yeah. it, it's definitely gotten. <laughs> well, Paul to a has point been where, heavily botted. It's just yeah, that idea. too. But I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's gotten to a point where a lot of these places, it's just it's it's nothing more than that's where you get that too. Right. Cause I mean, dig used to be a thing which met its own death. I wonder if Reddit will meet the same kind of death as well. Oh. Yeah. But, Reddit uh, went to war with dig. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they cut and they won out, but I mean, yeah. dig was kind of already dying before. Yeah. Um, Spark and, was before dig. That was like the guy that ran it was like a total, like shit lib egomaniac. Like it was, he just destroyed his own website basically. Um, if you're listening to this, Fark, which I know you're not, but like I hate you by the way, but um, no, it's <laughs> <laughs> then like, <laughs> then like, well, it's something like, personal, but we hate you. Yeah, we hate, yeah, exactly. Same with, same with Big Yod. Like it's nothing personal, but the fact that you created someone like Ayala, eh, I don't know about that. If we're thinking about the same person, that person is an incredibly amazing object lesson for <laughs> just like millennial women maybe or is she, is, is she a zoomer i don't know she's but oh she's like, yeah she's like on the border of gen x millennial yeah yeah but it's just like it's uh yeah that's just an object lesson for for those people i don't know i mean i, I think that that makes sense <laughs> that person's kind of artistic almost you know it is yeah. no she is i believe she's a poster artist i mean i debated it ayala once on follow the rules and it was quite an experience i mean uh but i think that ayala like the we know what really tipped me off was the recent one, the uh, dog one. That was uh, oh, girl. You know, that was, yeah. <laughs> like that's like the, the memes. The, the memes. The memes that came out of that one were the best. There, there's this classic meme from what was it, 2018, about like my bike got stolen, but the total happiness and the oh, yeah. increase on the guy who sold it. And there's one made a version of it where it's like, well, my dog died today. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you can imagine where the variation of the comic goes. <laughs> I was gonna post. I was gonna post the dying fetus lyrics. Um, K word your mother, R word your dog. <laughs> like you know that's now that because they were spoofing like how people, you know, thought of metal lyrics because you know believe it or not, dying fetus actually do have deep a lot of like politically driven lyrics. Um, they're actually a pro, believe it or not, they actually have pro life lyrics. There's this really? one song. There's this one song. It's called From Womb to Waste. Very, it actually does have an unironic pro life message. Um, well, I, know, no, I remember yeah. Cradle of Filth had a song called Lord Abortion, and I, oh, I remember yeah. saying that as a young progressive and going, 
so is this pro-life because like they're supposed to be like the, the theme of their band is demonic so are they saying that like you know a demon would have a name like lord abortion <laughs> Oh man, but no, but yeah, like you, I think another thing we're neglecting is sort of, um, which I mean, nowadays, um, well, you can't really neglect it because a lot of people on it have so much power, um, is of uh, something awful was integral to that culture as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it was before it all in a lot of ways. And you know, it's just nowadays, I mean, there's probably some kind of, uh, deep uh, glow in the dark uh, CIA stuff going on. But the fact that like a lot of them are journalists and editors and like, it's just, and you know, it's incredible, but something awful for a time did have a lot of like formulated a lot of the edgier sort of cultural output on the internet. Like they, they tested the limits of it. Um, and then later, you know, then later, of course the right wing versions came about, but uh, I, I yeah. think, you know, there has to be, there could be a whole genealogy done on this type of stuff. Um, but, you know, yeah, but, yeah. But, but I guess what I would, my, my hope is that Substack is going to sort of slow things down. Mm. For, I, 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 I'm really hoping that, that, you know, I think that 2000, obviously Twitter just, that's the, that's the elephant in the room. Yeah. But after Twitter, you know, after we all got banned from Twitter and we all got demonetized on YouTube, which used to be the two things in 2016 when I started my channel that were really the right epicenters. And for a while we moved to discord. Yeah. Which was a false promise. And you know, that's <laughs> the one, that's the one that everyone gets suckered into a social media and then shock when they're banned from it. Mine was discord. And um, the, I, I think that the next development, the next space for domination for the right is Substack. Oh, it's already it, it has, it has all the right components for it. It feels like the next logical step for for the right wing. It feels like it's a space that it feels like you can. It feels sort of like YouTube did a, a while, like in 2015, where like you could write something really special. Like if I feel like now, if I write, I, I should. I am still writing videos, but I feel now that if I write videos, I um, they'll just go into the ether and never be heard of again, right? Yeah, yeah. And so. Um, you know, I, I feel very de definitively that that Substack has this vibe to it where it's like you could put something very special here yeah. and it would stay special. The magic of it wouldn't go away. Uh, people would come back to it later and find it. And it, it, even if they don't, you know, maybe you can take your Substack essays and put them together and make a book. And then that would be like the foundation of something. It, it really, It really feels like it has a solidity to it that feels like you're not standing on sand. Like all the other social media feels like you're standing on sand, but yeah. Substack feels like you could actually put down something solid. You could actually and, fed post. <laughs> yeah. I guess you can't, I don't know what the rules are, but it is a very hard thing to ban. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. To and get, I mean, you know. I, I think you can easily Google search it either is another charm. Yeah. Tool. If you Google suppresses I, the, Oh, sorry. I think the, I think the benefit though if, is it though is that it is sort of like a return to the blogosphere. I mean, this is where yeah, real that's thought where I came can be. From, man. <laughs> I mean, that's where that's where I mean thought can really be yeah. fleshed out. And I think also it has to be done by a lot of ways, technological necessity. I mean, I uh, maybe this is me reading too much into it, but I think of all the guys that have made like GPT three bots of like four chan green texts and how some yeah. of them are incredibly realistic, like. And, you know, if the poster and Twitter is going to be a thing, it can be very easy, I think, to um, in some ways either impersonate or to make it just incredibly lowest common denominator and not really get a get, get the message out. And I think that's why the yeah. live stream and why the blog has become so uh, important sort of to like the right wing idea space and culture space is because this will this conversation will you can go back to it and you can take something away from it whereas a scripted video you get it you heard the thesis statement and you know people don't want to watch that as much but like a, a conversation or a long form blog post where there are things yeah. to constantly come back to yeah. and pick apart i think it does mean a lot because the you know um the the youtube space and the twitter space they have a way of aging incredibly quickly. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I posted one time on Twitter, like the, the, the VidCon 2017 comic article that Sargon posted about Anita Sarkeesian calling him a garbage human being. Oh, like that feels God. like a century ago. Or do you want to know what yeah. else? Yeah. Thousands of centuries ago. Thousands of <laughs> centuries ago. And what feels like a hundred years ago was the whole Achilles thing on Twitter. 
You yeah, know? yeah, like, yeah. What, what's yeah. the Achilles? What, what is the Achilles thing on Twitter? What, oh, oh <laughs> what, what, what fuck. Did, did, I, did I miss that? What, what year was this? This this, this year, that shortly shortly ago. before the event in February, um, this guy named Achilles had basically had proposed to an e girl uh, on Twitter, yeah, and it came son, out who had a mixed race son. Yeah, it, it came out she had like an OnlyFans and a mixed race child, and there was a like Achilles Twitter has space. been cool to me. I don't want to bash him. Yeah, but. and there was a Twitter space where like a thousand other guys from Frog and bap twitter just recorded it. him in public and recorded yeah. it and it was this huge episode he, no, because you sent her a five thousand dollar wedding ring yeah know, five thousand dollar engagement person. ring or something yeah. yeah yeah um god and uh oh my god um i wanted to ask you dave mm -hmm. um before we go on but before i ask you um what was i gonna say there are some twitter posters who are kind of like gp3t um but they're like they're a, a human parody of the GPT three technology, like Paul G Scholes is one of them. GPT three, uh, can, what's the acronym? Yeah, what is it called? Oh, that's a good question. Matt, oh, um, it's it's like yeah, it's some programming thing. But yeah, Paul Scholes is one of them. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, is, 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 is this is this an AI? Is that what you're yeah, talking generative pre-trained transformer three, an auto regressive yeah. language model that uses deep learning to produce human-like text. Oh, okay, okay, so it just basically produces. Uh, stuff that plausibly sounds human. Okay, fair yeah. enough. But I would say though that there are accounts now. Um, there's this one account on Twitter. Um, oh, sorry, I just I, every opportunity I have to bash false calls. Uh, gr <laughs> Griffy man. Um, there was there's this account on Twitter, and it's really close to my heart because this is where I came. You know, the sort of we all try to centralize the blog sphere with sites like Thermidor and Social Matter. Um, there's this account called Forgotten Frog Twitter that posts screen caps of prolific frogs from like 2015, 2014, 2016. And like some of the bangers of years and years past still has a resonance today. Really? I, just, I wouldn't have anticipated that. Yeah. Search up forgotten frog Twitter. But mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you though, Dave, how, why did you exit from the Twitter sphere? Why did you get rid of your, uh, uh yeah, you just didn't. Well, I felt like it was killing my attention. First of all, I kind of got back on the last month, which is not a good thing. Hmm. But, um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm struggling with my relationship with that. But um, the uh, the reason why I got off it and created like I got off of it because it was killing my attention span, and I had like all of these weird, creepy like bread tube hangers on. Oh uh, yeah, that yeah, were like yeah. they're sent after January sixth. A bunch of them sent me all these like creepy, threatening messages. One of which actually got read on Ethan Ralph's oh, stream. Yeah, uh, I know uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the yeah, adventure, yeah. but but that was there were a lot of people like that, and you know I just got like what is I kind of took a look at it and I'm like what the hell is this website doing for me? Yeah. <laughs> right, this is you this know, is you know what's funny? You want it's killing my attention span. You know, it's making me worry yeah. when I should be worrying about my. You know, then one year old son, and uh, and I mean, it just it seemed it seemed completely. Un and I hate Twitter. I mean, I still hate Twitter. You know, I mean, it's great. It's amazing for promotion. It's amazing for promotion. But in, in right now, you're telling me about three year old tweets to still have resonance, and I can't even imagine them. Right? Well, you, 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 you know, I would read. You know, I would read tons of old blog posts from the yeah. rationalist community, even pe people I hate, like Ellie Eiser Yudikowsky. But I, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read their old tweets. <laughs> oh man, maybe because I'm just a Twitter addict. That's my problem. Yeah. Uh, it's just like I'm too. You You're know, just a fan of short form content. You're a connoisseur of short form content. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think because to me, the way I always approached it was it's sort of like the sketch before the painting in terms of writing, and I should think that's probably the healthy way to tweet. To, but I, like this is why I could never understand that there's some people who became quite prolific as thread men like ZHP, of course, but I could never understand like the long thread because to me, I love the short thread, like the logo dot list, like five to eight thread because anything longer than that, it's like, I might as well just write a sub stack. Yeah. Like I, it's like, yeah, it's that weird balance, but uh, it's just like uh, any, it's, I, I was going to spill the beans about the particular person you were talking about. Well, um, I, a person's I think completely disappeared into the ether. So yeah. Know. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. Uh, this particular person, um, a, a year ago, um, a certain uh, former uh, partner of mine wanted to bring him on the show, and I'm like, no, do not do this. This is not. Uh, I, I, you can bring him on the show; it wouldn't be very interesting. There's another person that I, 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 
People ask me why I really hate counterpoints. I had another one that exchanged with him. Oh, it's creepy. Yeah. Like I just freaking cre he creeped the, me the hell out in one of these these DM exchanges, and I can't remember if it was on Discord or Twitter. But since then, I've just had this like I don't. Know, I probably shouldn't be bitter. I not bitter, but I should, probably shouldn't hold grudges against people on the internet. But yeah, like, that yeah. really did it for me, you know. And people yeah. ask me why I just really dislike this individual, and that's why. That's interesting. When he was on my previous show, uh, he was all right to me. Like I didn't, I didn't realize he was like that into it. Like he, that's weird though. That's like he. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like I'm just gonna. I don't want to like, but this this is a person who is like, I mean, maybe it's his personality thing, but he yeah. was like all into this counter radicalization, uh, along with the other individual oh. I mentioned. Like he was all <laughs> over that stuff, right? Yeah. And yeah. like you know, he, he was just trying to get information on who was radical and who was like a potential danger to the state, and like that was his thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you know, he appears like two years later doing streams with like Lauren Southern. <laughs> right. Oh God! Yeah, and then, yeah. then he, he he says ridiculous things like in 2018 he did a video about how his favorite YouTuber was ContraPoints, like unironically, and, and and not in the way that I appreciate ContraPoints is like you know a, 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 an unwitting right winger. Like I I don't believe for a second that a person like that you know like listens to ContraPoints when he's painting like Warhammer miniatures. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and so like you know, and, and, you know, and, and this is just like I just can't. Whenever I feel someone's being two faced, I my 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 um I, I I shouldn't be talking about this person, but you know there. No, 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 no. And I just want to say I have no beef with this person, but I mean, yeah, that just uh, sounds strange. That's right? my thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it does it does sound very strange. Um, like the counter radicalization, like having experienced uh some of these people, it's very funny how uh, my good friend Daniel Miller once wrote an essay called the anti the uh what was it called um. The the psychol the mass the mass psychology of the anti fascist where it's almost like a religious obligation they have and like the way that they pretend to be like agents and the way that they have a very like a very like monotone way of discussing the enemy uh, us it's like this hyper moralization mixed in with this like clinical um, like you know, this chain of association of the radicalization. Yeah, that that's a, my, my problem with ContraPoints is not, ContraPoints is not that he's an anti-fascist. No, no, no. It's no. just that, like, he just, like, his channel is, like, mostly, like, like, Warhammer. Like, he just does, he basically, like, just reviews of, like, Warhammer lore on his channel. Yeah. Like, when he's not doing Twitch debate streams. This is, that's not my, my problem is, if he was a sincere anti-fascist, caught up in a mob mentality that right. would be one thing what, what i don't like about him is that he's transparently doesn't care about ideas and doesn't, transparently doesn't care about the ultimate destination of culture and so whenever he's in the space it kind of reveals that whatever is going on there is probably supremely fake mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. so because of that i can't help but kind of being drawn into that and i um you know yeah, I, I don't doubt that his interaction with me uh, in the whole January 6th thing was him posturing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, back then, you know, it was, it was not entirely cringe to be thinking that that was a genuine insurrection. But, um, oh. you know, I, you I, 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 should, I shouldn't get into internet yeah, drama, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but um, I mean, in general, I didn't mean him. I mean, like, in general, it seems that um, because I, I noticed, like, I don't want to like again. I mean, I'm always I, I always tend towards black pilling more than optimism. But mm -hmm. I think that when you do it, like I, I've I've um, been talking with people who are more familiar with the political left in terms of like the way that these people actually operate. Um, yeah, it's it's uh wait, let me just put my camera off for a second. Yeah, so I was talking to people. Um, and one, one person is a well-known podcaster and we might do business together. And she was talking about the utter exhaustion of the left and how a lot of like the discourse around tracking the political right is sort of like, what else are they going to do besides like ensure these power relations? But when it comes to actual production of any sort of um, grand totalizing vision of uh, whether it be aesthetic or cultural or whatnot, when it comes to like their actual core beliefs, I mean, there's something lacking there. I don't notice. I mean, apart from the usual like television schlock and like the usual propaganda, it seems like propaganda and politics has consumed them whole. 
and, and nothing yeah. nothing tracks this better online than like El Chapo Trap House. Yeah, yeah. Like you was, can see gonna, you can yeah. see the exhaustion. Yeah. Like that was yeah. in 2016. That felt like I really disliked the dirt bag left because it reminded me of the new eight, like the cringier elements of the new oh, atheist yeah. movement. Oh, yeah. But still, like in 2016, like you could feel the energy, the, the, like the excitement. And then, you know, strangely enough, over the course of the Trump administration, they got angrier and angrier and angrier. And then when Biden became president, all that anger just got, seemed to get tied in this strange knot, right? Yeah. Well, I, w- I wanted to ask you about the dirtbags. Like, what do you what do you think of their, um, you know, these irony leftists on Twitter, like I've had interactions with them, which are not very good. Um they, they always use that same photo of me from 2015. Um, mm-hmm. But what do you think of like the way that they approach at, like everything? It seems like the inherent contradiction of, um, you know, I don't believe in anything like just touch grass, bro, smoke some weed, have a barbecue. And also like, I believe in like every aspect of progressive ideology. It seemed like apart from that, I mean, I was talking to someone who knows these people and he, um, he said that, they they almost have a lot of the same upbringings and affectations of even like the e right like even like they are the yeah problem. if you ask yeah. me my I, I i probably perceive them very much the same way that a, a gay person would perceive like closet cases mm. you know i i th- these these people are temperamentally not designed to be on the left and them being on the left is like someone trying to feed a carnivore like a mm. vegan diet and so they either become emaciated and weak or they become incredibly anxious and frustrated. And the, the, there was, what was it, Mike Christman or whatever? Mac uh, I was about to say, your, your, your video on the grill pill and that. Christman, yeah, I think he did this example. amazing yeah, set of videos. That I don't know where you can still find it. But he did this amazing set of videos where he tries to get his followers to take the grill pill. And it ends up... It ends up kind of doing the contrapoints thing where where he has to kind of like always assure his audience that he's not moving towards the right. Oh, but God. at the same time, it, it feels like his conclusions are fundamentally right. Once you kind of hit your reset button and kind of take things from the ground level, from the most basic level, mm-hmm. I mean, how can you avoid the conclusion that personal virtue and family are the more important things and that you know the the question of of truth goodness and beauty uh, have an imminent nature to them that can't be met by some theoretical revolution that they all know will not happen within their lifetimes and probably not happen ever yeah and yeah that that once you ask the question in that way like you can't help but come to conclusions that are right when so like they have to kind of be always running away from that it seems and that's I can't help but see them always like dodging away from these conclusions. The more and more they try to ground themselves in realistic stuff. There, there was this, um, there, there was this documentary that it was one of these like, you know, poorly put together, um, like indie, like Netflix things on the alt right, and it focused on this one activist, this black guy uh, who like made a career out of like following the hairdo around, you know, um, mm-hmm. and. At the very end, apparently they couldn't get him in person. They actually had a phone interview with Kushbaum, uh, Matt Kreisman. And mm-hmm. it's funny because he can tell that the trajectory of the world and the way that the Western uh, the Western sort of like civilization is going. You could tell like he knows that a lot of like right wing conclusion to things are inevitable. But there was this one moment where he said like, you know, the reason the alt right is popular is because like when there's ecological devastation and it's like, you know, we have enough resources to share the wealth and to feed the world. Some people are going to choose to close the borders and they're going to choose G word eyed. And it's like, you know, there, you know, there's people that are going to do that. And it's like, I know that he like, he's smart enough to know that, when it comes right down to it, if there was a disaster that most people like basically nut up and become very, like very, uh, they, they, they realize that there's only a certain set of conclusions that can come off as like incredibly right wing. No, there Um, there are two right wing conclusions, right? You either, you either take yourself and you become Francis of Assisi and you dedicate yourself to, helping like the most degenerated and downtrodden people with your own resources or you become 
you know, St. Louis and, and defend your people. Right. And, and, you know, maybe you, there's more luxury, more risk and more manliness in the St. Louis option. I think there's manliness in the St. Francis of Assisi option. Right. But the, 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 the progressive playbook is to take, you know, your people and put them on the altar while you go and smoke weed. Like that's, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and like, that's like what, progressivism has done but they've done it because the decision points have been so stretched out and and the feedback loops have been so as nick land would put it the feedback loops have been so um uh largened uh, is that the word to use they've been so divorced from their actual consequences that you know the the innobility of that third option has been obscured right, right and uh that's really the op like in a resource constrained world whether it's climate change or just the fact that everything's falling apart you know we uh, it doesn't even really matter right like if you yeah. and i don't think you know matt christman's about to become san francis of assisi or you know like a, a beggar in, in, to, to help like you know a starving african refugee i don't think that's like in his constitution and so like the you know the other option is to like if you defend because if you defend your own stuff and you don't defend your your peoples then like what kind of person are you right right you know, like this is what i always say about christianity like it's not christian to sacrifice your family like for the poor of the world because like the family has been put in your like they they've put their trust in you like they've put their interests and in, your their wealth is not yours to give away, like in a really radical sense. Not even in sort of like you know oh you know the welfare like the objectivist sense, but just in like it, just in a direct responsibility sense. And so the 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 idea that you can sacrifice that and that somehow like some kind of noble ideal of progressivism is absolutely insane, and and, and it's transparently insane if you actually see it in the real world, which is why. You know, the real world is right when. <laughs> well, I, I think that's why your point about where, where bread tube is is kind of dead, or the the, the post trapo, uh, you know, internet left is where it is because, you know, Matt Kreisman basically telling his followers to take the grill pill is not the next generation or the next uh, iteration of of the left online where it's now you do have the the parasocial friendship thing where. Like you had said, it's just, you know, rambling and playing video games while smoking weed on camera and people giving their money. Um, there is no reason for people to say touch grass or anything or, or to take the grill pill. It's just, well, there's always a new personality, a new bit of drama to, to dive into. But um, I wanted to ask you this, though, uh, because we mentioned this before you came on, Dave, was that um, was since we're in this moment of this vibe shift. What, what do you think is to uh, to come for both art and culture in the future? Because I don't think no one knows, but I think we all have an idea. And I was just wanting to know what you think might lie ahead now. Uh, well, and that's there's so many different ways you could answer that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of imagining much more basic art forms, much more simple art forms becoming the, the priority, uh, you know, becoming something that people deal with a lot more. Um, I think that it, you know the 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 language of the real world. We have to find out what the language of the real world actually is mm. after after COVID. And you know, this is one thing about rap that um, you know a lot of people don't. Uh, you know, a lot of people on the right wing dismiss rap, and I don't like it musically so much. But I kind of appreciate it aesthetically because it, it is an attempt to. It capture the the emotion, like the real emotion of being in sort of these these third world enclaves that we call ghettos and, and the first world. And and because of that, like what what do rap bands, like intellectual rap bands, say about rap? It's real, right? And it's even white intellectual fans of rap say that. And even though it's nothing they've experienced, but they understand that like in that our form is like an attempt to capture like what it is to be me and what it is to feel this way in this moment right and the problem is is that uh we as right-wingers uh we need to kind of capture moments where 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 we feel promise in, in in the future and and kind of like have the courage to kind of follow that in our own lives and and sort of describe it for other people um i i, I think that the, there's a problem with 
the right in that uh, I think social media has really done this is that uh, what, what sells on social media about track like so here's an example like one of my favorite artists I think God I remember this person because I'm it sounds so horribly abstract without examples but um you know one of my favorite artists uh, is Owen Cyclops on Twitter. oh yeah Yep. Okay, but I mean, like, okay, you know, and that's fine. Like, he's he's kind of telling me what I want to hear, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you know what what kind of, you know what kind of makes him interesting is that um, the the uh, the the you know, other than that we share worldviews, obviously, right? Um, yeah. Is that uh, what makes him interesting, especially the stuff about his family? Is that um, all of the trad stuff is uh, it's very Instagram esque. It's very like, oh, well, you know, this is my perfect life. And like when I take a picture, like I'm composing it in Tableau so that like the, the stuff that like is a little not picturesque, like doesn't show through. But uh, uh, Owen Cyclops's work uh, does kind of gravitate to some of the less picturesque stuff. Oh, yeah. And it does have a certain amount of humor and it does sort of, it feels hopeful. It feels the same way that I would feel when I I watched uh, or saw something like a uh, a oh, well these these example like uh, I was thinking like for better or for worse or family circus but those are so saccharine as to be kind of like ridiculous but you know like in the nineties there were examples of like media you could watch and they were kind of a little bit messy around the corners but it still presented this vision of of this 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 thread of life that you could follow personally and. Uh, and, and I think that that is going to be the the, the struggle of right wing art is to come, come up with something basic and something real that, that kind of parses out a, a thread of life uh, among the overpowering uh, will to death that that this pervades our culture all around us. And but, um, yeah, but do you I, notice? I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Oh well, the the point about rap, I, I have somewhat of a a controversial take on this, but I think that that authenticity, why, like why everyone says rap is real, right? Like these ghettos and sort of the enclave mm -hmm. that these it's people subaltern music, but I mean, but yeah. it, it comes from the post 1965 great society that basically destroyed the black middle and upper class to a great extent. Yeah. yeah like the, the quality of life between 1965 and today is night and day difference where things were clearly better. And I think that in the wake of this great awakening, the, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion stuff, the, the very blatant sort of anti-white position that we're getting, I really do think that you're going to see a lot of authenticity come from the growing number of like white SoundCloud rappers. And I know that sounds like oh, a really? very odd. Oh, I, I think that that's where we're going to see a lot more where people like white, deracinated, despondent guys are going to like take this art culture and this art form that has always been the thing that since the 80s has been called the real thing, the authentic deal. And they're going to start talking about their own problems, whether it's about opioids, their own parents being emotionally hurt, not being available. I really do think that we're going to see a lot more of authentic sounding music that will not be like right wing, you know, prima facie, but will be right wing in its tone because it is authentic about the real world. Yeah. But well, metal, I heard this, yeah. I heard metal had thing. a chance to be that, but it just squandered it on Reddit people. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I was going to say pulp, Paul, I remember Paul Fahrenheit saying something similar, but uh, you know, I have to go uh, uh, right about now. But but I will say, a uh, prudentialist, uh, you know, you, your your vision of, of white sound cut cloud rap, rappers uh, being the ascendant force it, it's confirmed by Amazon, who's revealed that uh, Sauron, the Lord of Darkness, is in fact a white sound cloud rapper. Oh boy! Um, <laughs> oh, before before boy. you leave, Dave, we have one we have one super chat for you. Oh sure, was, sure. Uh, right up and right right for you so I'm, I'm gonna go with it this is from the very beginning right before we went live it's from felix fairmount for ten dollars us he says dave did you choose orcs because they are the most degenerated <laughs> race mirroring our own civilization and Whoa. is the vibe shift our wag um is 40k the dissident right harry potter keep up the good work my <laughs> brothers in christ so so in 2020 when i was stuck on lockdown um after the election well, the, I, actually, it was just leading up to the election. I got totally burnt out on politics, and I painted a Warhammer army. And that army was orcs. And I'm not so sure how I feel about that. I'm a little bit ashamed, a little bit proud. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a fun hobby. And um, so, uh, really, it, it just – whenever I play games or choose, like, uh, deep board gaming, I, I always pick – I always the, – the question I always ask is, what is the faction that's most fun to play against? And I always choose that one. 
Uh, so it was, um, it felt like it was, the, it felt like it was very 40 K and it felt like it wasn't too serious. And, you know, I, and it was also an aggressive faction and always in video games or in, in any game, I always pick the one that's the most like in your face aggressive because that's the most fun to play. Right. It, it, it can sink your teeth into it. Right. <laughs> I feel, I feel really weird ending on a question about a nerdy <laughs> game. So, well, the other question was, are you really the Dave Mustaine of the right wing? Oh, Dave yeah, Mustaine. Well, what's Dave Mustaine? You know, Megadeth. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't know any uh, of the names. I don't know the, who's the guy in Metallica. Who, oh, what's his name? James face? Hetfield. James Hetfield. Yeah, I never uh, remember. Like the, the 80s metal, I, it just feels like the, it's the bands and not the people. But I don't even remember who Dio was associated with, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm he sorry. had his own band and then he was in uh, Black Sabbath. For yeah, him. yeah, I, I know. But like, yeah. it's just. You know, it's all it, the the names get mixed up. But yeah, I I don't know. I wish I was more of a Megadeth fan. I guess. Oh. Well, th those were the questions directed for you. I think uh, Gio and I can handle the rest. But I, right. I just want to say again, Dave, thank you so much for yeah, coming this has on. Been great, we're, we're really oh appreciative of the, of you taking the time. Oh, to, no, no, absolutely. Uh, I want to have you guys on my channel someday too. So let's. Uh, yeah. keep, I'm just really yeah. backlogged in my live streams, but, but have a great night, guys. Okay. God all right. Bless. Take care. Cheers. Thank God you. bless. Whoa. All right, let's let's get to the last of the super chats then. Yeah, and uh, now that the, now that the Dave questions had been asked, I wanted him to definitely answer the forty k yeah. one. So, uh, Cinder Mountain Villager for ten dollars US from our, our good friends at the Iron Age Archives. He says, "Will there ever be a Shieldings like art opening slash fine art slash mixed media event? Would it be worth organizing and selling tickets for?" Well, I suppose that comes to whether or not we can find a, a place to do it or a gallery. But I know that in New York City, there was um, FedFest, the sort yeah. of like underground guerrilla, uh, you know, event style we're talking about. There was LD50 in 2016. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, um, that ended a disaster, though. That ended a disaster. Oh, well, yeah. I, I think that, that something like that is still very feasible and very possible. Yeah. Uh, in in today's day and age, for sure, for sure. And then uh, and then Pill Eater almost got into a fight with Paul Town in FedFest, but that's okay. another story. <laughs> well, I just know that it happened because uh, Art Stained Haynes was telling me about it. Yeah, yeah, it was. It got pretty hairy. Oh, <laughs> but uh, I, yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um, Raging Mandrill for four ninety nine US. Thank you so much. Oh, he says flat art is the new cubism, only feminized and family safe in quotation marks. Total inversion of the hard-edged, darker-colored cubist form. Uh, mm. Geo, your your thoughts? Interesting take. Um, I I trace it in the notes to my book that I want to write pretty soon. I trace it to a bit of cubism, but more fauvism, and also certain um, 20th century, like earlier interwar period forms of illustration you could easily trace it back also i mean also like you know Bauhaus and corporate memphis and the styles that were coming out of the 80s and 90s and the illustration and the graphic design world you can easily trace it to them but it, it, yeah cubism definitely i think is a huge influence but of course fauvism and cubism sort of go together in certain periods in the 19th and 20th century so uh yeah that's a good point um it's Definitely, I would think it, it sort of purposefully lacks the neo-primitivism of certain elements of cubism you find in Picasso and then later, even in the 80s, Basquiat. Um, you you know, obviously because neo-primitivism and Art Brut is uh, too, quote unquote, problematic. But uh, there is actually there is a form of neo primitivism, but of course the way they sell it in flat design is that this by POC artist is on Instagram creates flat design illustrations because she herself is an obese quarter uh, Cherokee uh, you know quarter come uh, in you know uh, quarter uh, Hindu Kamala Harris amalgamation of uh, you know what is Kamala Harris? She's like quarter brother sister. Sorry. And she's like Indian, and, Indian. Yeah, uh, she 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 is the living embodiment of like the Hollywood meme of like an ethnically ambiguous, uh, you know, woman what of color Sam with call a white it? husband. Yeah, Sam Hyde called them racially ambiguous gold skin girls. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, she's basically that, but for for politics uh, yeah, at this the fact point. That she's like the fact she never have kids though. That's kind of weird. Like in America, doesn't she have? I mean, isn't she like a stepmom? Doesn't her, her yeah, husband doesn't count. have children? Someone like that in politics does. I don't know who, but anyways, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the last two are from Cinder Mountain Villager. Since we got the Dave questions out of the way, um, he uh, he says for ten dollars US. Thank you so much. You've been very generous tonight. Uh, he says add Slam Poetry Night to the Art Right event. Um, I feel like if a, a slam poetry event happened here in the uh, in, in the right wing, I feel like it would be something a- along the lines of you know what what Sam Hyde has done. Um, mm. But I, I I don't know. I just feel like slam poetry from the right would just be dripping with irony because a so- lot of slam poetry is so shit lib lived experience. I am a woman of color. America is a gun. Bad, 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 bad. I am a nasty woman. Yeah, I am a yeah. bitch. You know, like all the things that just like it, <laughs> Gorman. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's it's just that. Um, I I but I I'd be all for it. Oh, and he's replying so in capital. Um, you know what? Fine. I I say bring there, it. I want I want Sam Hyde style dripping with irony slam poetry nights. Well, um, there's poetry. There is poetry readings. I know White Art Collective does that. I want people but, to be reading. Yeah. I, I want them to be reading their Fed Posty tweets that got them banned on Twitter. And um, I want that happening on a stage. Now I would think about it. I'd pay good I, money for that. <laughs> let's take the one tweet I have, but nobody got. Like, you know, when Putin, he had the speech where he's like, I am a Tartar. I am a, I am a Muslim. I am a, uh, you know, I am a, a Mongol. I am a Russian. I am a Kievian. And like, I had the same tweet like because someone else did it, but I did. Uh, Isn't like, that what Governor Cuomo did about New York, where he's just like, "Yeah, Governor, I am, I am a black thing. woman. I am an Italian. You know." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and so I had one. And it's like I'm a frog. I'm a frog poster. I'm a wig gnat. I am an anime racist. I am a trad. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the whole gamut of the e right. Yeah. Hey, there you go. So yeah. someone's got it. There, sneed poetry. poetry. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? Like it would just be. It, in some ways, LD50 was kind of like that. In that. Yeah, you had like a finer context where they would literally just put tweets in a gallery. Which I mean, the problem with LD fifty, like you know, I'm good friend, like I'm friends with um, with Daniel Miller who organized it, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Ace Rob Flynn did it. Oh my god, um, it's like the th- thing with LD fifty is a lot of those guys they weren't like actual artists apart from like a few of them, like you know Daniel Miller and a few others. Like a lot of them were just posters that did things that were sort of like a visual representation of the ideas of frog Twitter at the time. I even think the thinker of ironies had a few things in there, but, uh, thinker of ironies. Um, no, but yeah, it's like, I, I think that there is definitely, like I said in my essay in 2018, I said like, what if someone funded like a hundred LD 50 galleries, you can't cancel all of them. Like you have to, you know, I mean, what, what if you truly did have a funding network and like yeah. a? Well, and then you know, that's like, actually the last super chat of the night. Actually, oh yeah, go ahead. It, it, from Cinder Mountain Villagers is: Do you guys and those of you in chat, so you guys get to participate? Take Peter Thiel's well, money. Um, do you oh, think sorry. that this sphere would support crowdfunded art and film projects, kind of like Comicsgate back in the day? I think that kind of was leading into what you were talking about. Because if you could crowdfund like fifty LD fifties, yeah, um, that would be great. Yeah, I know that um, Alex Lee Moyer, she crowdfunded or like she had. I was just told that Alex Lee Moyer was on Tim Pool. So, yeah, yeah. Um, She she was probably getting PFL money, but uh, no, she I want I want her on content line in a way. I can't because I know I'm friends with Barrett and Barrett like is one of her producers. But uh, I know that she did a bit of crowdfunding and she uh, funded the Alex Jones documentary, which I, I think there hasn't really been a comprehensive Alex Jones documentary up until now. I mean, there's YouTubers that do it. I know Turkey Tom did one. I know like bread tubers have done some similar shit, but like she did an actual like honest documentary with Alex Jones and his history. And like, I wanted to write, I, I remember like way back in the day, I wanted to write an article called the metaphysical war of Alex Emmerich Jones. But I know that people, it was right after you did the Joe Rogan live stream that got like 40 million hits. Um, because I, I truly believe that he has this like weirdo, like Gnostic interpretation of, uh, 
the um you know the cosmos a yeah. christian gnostic interpretation of the spiritual war that we find ourselves in that's why in my mind alex jones is really the um quintessential american shaman of the 21st uh, shaman fool uh archetype of the 21st century in america because he, he like if you want to talk about someone who embodies so many different strains of americana alex jones is the guy and it truly, For sure. this is why I will always stand Alex Jones. And he, uh, he truly is one of those cultural figures that I feel is one of the last gasps of true, like American folklore and spirituality. And, uh, you know, I mean, it is funny. Like I was thinking about this prude. I wanted to run this by you. Like, yeah, yeah. I keep calling you prude, but like fucking. Man, oh, you're I, fine. Okay. I, either, yeah. Either's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Uh, I, I know like you have a, like your family, um, like, can you, are you like all the way back to the Mayflower or you're sort of near close? Uh, yes, actually. So I, on my mother's side, all the way back to the Mayflower, um, and we can trace our lineage to like back to Charlemagne. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, my, my dad's side though is, uh, 1840s Irish came over, but, yeah, but still, like that's pretty close to like original American. Like, well, it's, it, it's OG as it gets right. Yeah. But, yeah. um, for an Irish yeah. man, it's pretty much yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, for on my mother's side, it, it goes back to the, pretty much the English coming here. Yeah, um, and nope. uh, and it, it is a weird. It's kind of weird. It's just like, oh, I have family that fought for both sides of the Civil War. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Irish in the Civil War. That's another thing. There was a bunch. Like most, I think at one point, like there was almost like a silent, like a. Uh, like a slight majority among the uh, Union Army uh, of Irishmen, um, but th well, that being yeah, they, that Lincoln yeah. basically imported like like a giant chunk of Ireland to go keep fighting his oh war. Oh my god, that's terrible, man! Northern War of Aggression, and oh, that'll get me canceled. Um, anyways, oh, I, I think I said war between the states in a stream the other day. I haven't gotten any flack. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been told to hold on. He's got one more super chat in the works. But, yeah. Um, but I I wanted yeah, like his, no because like the thing about me is like I don't know if it's really a question but you know you you have like original like you have a, like you obviously have an investment in America because you are America in the sense of like your like your ancestry and your people were integral to like the way things are here yeah and you know and you come from the originary stuff it's sort of like in Canada if you came from that original Anglo loyalist stock or francophone you know you came you know your ancestor came from the streets of paris right like it's mm -hmm. the, the problem i i notice like when it comes to people like me is that in a, like the reality is is that i am a son of an ellis islander like my my family my mother's family when they came here like my mother literally came through ellis island yeah. to, in the 70s so it's like i don't like i know like people who are canadian they get pissed off um when I talk bad about Canada, cause like they obviously are like Francophone or mostly like Anglophone. And I, I tell them like, guys, you gotta realize like I am an Ellis Islander. Like I am spiritually homeless. Like really? Yeah, it's true. Like it's, you know, the, like my mother came here in the seventies. She literally came through Ellis Island. It's like the, only the Canadian, you know, she, they went to the Canadian side instead of the American side. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I, I probably would have been better off if my, uh, my mother chose the American, my, my grandfather chose the American side, but you know, we already had family here, you know, yeah, yeah. Works. Um, but th that's the thing. I don't have the same investment in like this project within Canada or within North America. I, and I really feel bad about that. Cause it's like, you know, it's true that this land of mine is like the only place that I, you know, was born and raised in, but at the same time, I don't feel any of that instinctual pull towards the way that if you were a British, like if you had British loyalist ancestry, like my father, he remembers a time in Canada where you could be proud of the British connection. You could be an Anglophile. And he is very much an Anglophile, uh, you know, when it comes to British history and everything. But to me, it's like, I don't know, like, it's just, what do you say? And I know this is like a big debate yeah, yeah. recently in it's, the... It definitely uh, is. In, in the alt-right, the, the, what not even alt-right, like, what would you call it? Like, the white, white uh, identity. Uh, like, I know, like, uh, you know, Joel and Keith, they've gotten a lot of flack from people, um, even people that are, you know, not to name names, but, like, you know, that mm -hmm. th when they say that America has 
a unique ethnogenesis. But I wonder, like, America, I think, does definitely have a unique ethnogenesis. But what is it, when it comes to, like, the Ellis Islanders, when it comes to the Polak, Italian, uh, even Irish to an extent, immigrants... Yeah, it, it's you know it, what what do we say about them in their relation to the North American societies, be it like America or Canada? Um, I mean, whatever I I, I guess what I whatever I say here, I I may have to do a whole essay or a video on it to give a more proper yeah, answer. Yeah. It seems like it's um, up your alley. It, though, it, it's a very question. loaded question, right? Because like you, no matter how you answer it, someone's going to get pissed off. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's but true, well, true. here's the thing, like. <laughs> For America, at least writ large, I would say prior, prior 1940, like prior to the 30s and 40s, America did kind of have a very unique, I would say it, it did have an ethnogenesis where, um, you know, eventually as I really, I, maybe out of 19, maybe actually out of 1965, it really came out, out yeah. of it. I, I, but like, you know, the Irish and the Italians kind of just get associated. Well, the Irish more than the Italians, for sure. But mm -hmm. a lot of Europeans, um, you know, anything really north of the Mediterranean got basically lumped in as white. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. I mean, consider, right, there was after, you know, the huge wave of Irish immigrants, the huge wave of German immigrants came here as well to a point where there are more people in America with German ancestry than there are Anglo. Um, yes, yes. And, and to a point, and I mean, it, it really did take two world wars to kill any German identity out of the country. World War One basically destroyed it, where German speaking newspapers and anti German sentiments changed. You know, the, no one spoke German really anymore after that. Even in Texas, there are a lot of German towns, uh, Munster, New Braunfels, and things like yeah. that. But I mean, yeah. like, uh, unless you go to those places and know like the very tiny subset of actual German speaking people there, um, it, it's all but gone. Um, so yeah. they kind of did get integrated into this sort of larger internationalist American idea of what it meant to sort of be like a white person. Um, and I mean, it's the same reason why, like, uh, uh, you know, maybe certain advocates for repatriation. I think that, I mean, blacks in America that have been here since, you know, they came aboard slave ships have undergone their own unique ethnogenesis. And right. they also under, they also underwent their own unique genocide. Um, the 19, like I mentioned earlier with Dave, like the 1965 black America was infinitely different and infinitely better than what we have today. And I think right. that anyone with a brain can look at that and be like, yeah, like, um, that period in between um, Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Act were uh, the greatest period of growth intellectually, culturally, economically for black America. Um, but, you know, and I think, again, I think white people, especially those who are more like white nationalist minded, would want to look towards the, the, the democide of black America from 1965 onward to today, because I think that we're going to see that happen to white people in America. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's what... Um, um, but as, as for the American, as for the American project or what it means to be an American, I mean, I, I, I have a, I have a longstanding history and love for my area historically where I live now. I, I have family that fought for both sides of mm -hmm. both the union and for the Confederacy. It's just, I, I get that I'm sort of living in an occupied state culturally and politically speaking. Oh, I get yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just wholeheartedly true. But I, I feel a lot like, and there's a lot of things where a lot of right wingers will get flack. Where it's like every generation of right wing commentary, it has a South African watch, and it's like, well, yeah, because I do think that there's a lot of things that are happening to like yeah. the Boers in South Africa that white Americans should pay attention to, um, oh, especially as as we continue to approach the South Africanization of the country. Um, so I, I, it's the same question of like, where do I go, right? Because there isn't a place where. I, an American that can trace his lineage back to like the Mayflower and even prior to like when before the United Kingdom became the United Kingdom before 1066 and the Battle of Hastings, it's just where do I go? Um, and, I, and like and, and here's the thing, like you, you might want to bash on Canada all you want, but I mean, where would you go, Gio? I mean, maybe uh, America. I don't know. But like, I have my Brazilian passport, so. Oh, well, there you go. You know, we can, yeah, we can, I will we be can, Bolsonaro's strongest soldier. There um, you, you can be Bolsonaro's largest soldier. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, it could you be can, his cultural <laughs> minister. <laughs> it yeah. could be his cultural minister to Canada or something. Who knows? But I mean, yeah, but that but for, realistically, for, you're right. That's never, for, for yeah. me though. That, that that's my. That, I, I run into this all the time because it's like I don't want to see the defeat or the humiliation of America because it's like yeah, I would love to see the like the gay or whatever you want to call it take an L. But yeah. I also recognize that means 
a lot of my countrymen either die or suffer, and I cannot in good conscience be an advocate for that. But I so, also, at the same time, this is where I, I'm like, well, that also sounds like sort of, but I, but I don't embrace the sort of larger Americanist, you know, well-coiffed gentleman that, uh, that we've referred to in his current right. takes on NATO and the current situation. So, so you're I'm not, left. So you're I'm neither here. that or or an Islamo No, like I'm, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not either. I'm I'm not either. I'm uniquely isolated from that. Where. I, I don't support either. <laughs> I think they're both kind of not good for me. Um, although I can, like, I, I do see that the sort of your Eurasianist side of things, I, I think that that will inevitably have its own political block in the future. Yes, that will. Um, like, that, 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 that's here to stay in a multipolar world order. But and I it, think there's it, even precedent for like, not third position, like, well, I don't know, that's a meme term, but like in America, there sort of was a nativist, but like quasi socialist politics. Yeah, that you I had think, Americans yeah. beware of foreign influence. I mean, America yeah. always had this. It really wasn't until the more internationalist, broad interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine did that change in 1896 with the Spanish-American yeah. War. And I mean, again, really, and this is where I think that perhaps, I mean, I know that's a meme term, but I think this is where some of the third positionists are correct, that yeah. you can't criticize these things without really taking a hard ha heavy handed critique of international finance and sort of globalized markets. Yes, um, yes, you, yes. you can't um, without bringing that into, into the point, which is why I think right wing critiques of capitalism are probably more effective again than left wing cr critiques of capitalism. Because oh, exactly. at the end of the day, every left wing critique of capital that I, I, I've heard uh, at least now, I mean, Twitter is a terrible place for discourse and you would need longer form conversation. But a lot of left wing Twitter discourse on capitalism is the same tired stuff that still gets us to where we are today. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, it just leaves me very isolated and very homeless because I know that I'm I, like, I get it that a lot of people that can trace themselves that far back are, are a minority. This is why Paul yeah. Fahrenheit gets so much shit on Twitter, despite the fact that I like, I agree with him on his perspectives of America. Like, um, why does he get shit on Twitter? Because he's like a, he's an Anglo respecter and he respects like, oh. you know, heritage Americans. Um, why is that controversial? Uh, because he's because uh, he I love him to death and he's kind of like chauvinistic about it. <laughs> and no, I think like that, you'd figure I, like I mean if you're a heritage American that's a good thing. Though. Yeah, if you're but like I Anglo mean, Dutch it, or whatever. It, it 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 just it comes with baggage I think in a lot of ways because it's like oh, oh because the, oh, then, and if you're a swarthoid like me. But, right? but I'm then a defender of America. That's the thing. Yeah. And, but yeah. people automatically assume that oh you're a defender of America so you're a defender of you know any three letter acronym that you want to use to describe the country. Country. well yeah, that's very yes but, but, but right i mean wing. but yes yeah. we love america but we don't support that and like this is where the old american adage of i love my people and i hate my government like really comes in yeah. for me because yeah. i love a very certain subset of people and uh, i really hate what my government has there, done there's to this a place. certain form of canada like there's a certain form of the landscape that i love um what is this oscar Geo has not had no actually i was going to ask um I was going to ask uh, John Pellick if it would be a good idea to have um, Ulysses uh, Capoy de Luz on content minded. I don't know if I'll do that or not. Um, anyways, no, but yeah, I think you're right. It's true. Like I, I personally don't see my future being in Canada. I see my future being more in the States, especially if things uh, work out with a certain friend of mine. Um, yeah. But it's just like, I, 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 but there are of course is problems with that. Like I just, the problem is I'm so inter terminally blackpilled because I just despise the way that Canada is. And I despise a, a huge section of the sort of anxious leftoid middle class that goes along with it because they're like, oh, at least we're not American. Like, it's like, I just really. Well, resent... isn't that sort of just the modern shit lib Canadian identity is heard? Yeah, or at least we're not left, American. Yeah, which I, just makes me, yeah. it, it gives me such an irrational hatred for urbanite canadians where it's like yeah, oh, we're not american i'm just like yeah i wouldn't want to be in your place either <laughs> yeah exactly like no because you have to realize that if america if they really if america got their shit together under like higher fear desantis or whatever like it, no, i'm not saying this will happen but like if america decided to go like full bore like revivalist revisionist nationalism canada would be kind of fucked actually because Canada would be the oh, first would, target. We, if that were the case, we'd just invade you again in the history of our revisionist nationalist yeah. history, um, which I think would probably be, be welcomed. 
<laughs> yeah, for a large a large population of Canadians, it's true. Like, no, but the thing is, you wouldn't even have to physically invade us. You wouldn't have to like pull a blue yellow on us. You just you would literally just have to cut us off, and that would yeah. be it. Like, you know. But uh, uh, but I will I will have to write you. more about this. Actually, I am writing about it. It'll be in the book. Um, yeah, I, I have yeah. a whole essay on what it means to be American to me. Um, but oh, uh, yeah, there was there was one last super chat that came in, so here it is, and it's right. for a shit ton of money, and I'm very thankful for it. Whoa! Uh, Cinder Mountain Villager for fifty dollars, United States. Thank Cinder Mountain you. Village. I hope when we have, uh, I hope when I hope you're around. When <laughs> I we hope have you're around when we host this on Geo's next week. Yeah, you um, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he says uh, we could. Whoa! Easily do... I'm gonna do the PPP. Whoa! There you go, right? Yeah, um, there you go. But he says we could easily do good slam poetry as a reaction. But if we made something anew and engage anew we could create something new why not try well you know what yeah. i say i say go for it um i my, i would my... i'd imagine it'd have to be organized somewhere um geographically more densely populated than me um but i mean i say go for it i say we set up an art event we do a, a gallery we can do it like the shieldings event where it's uh, where we can go as nons, right? And yeah. only in person, high cost barrier entry and organize and host a right-wing event where say Saturday evening, we have an open bar in the conference center and we do slam poetry and we try and, or make something new out of it, right? I think that that needs to be done because um, the best thing about this year so far for me was going to the event in February because I realized a lot of our disagreements can be hashed out rationally in person and that a lot of this, e-drama shit just doesn't happen when it translates to talking yeah. to like your you know your colleagues across the room in real life like i got to meet charlemagne the distributist and all these people that like i've that are they're now friends like i could like i would honestly like if charlemagne were to call me up the next day and be like hey man i need help with something like yeah i've met him i've shook his hand i've hugged him like i'm gonna go help him out you know what does charlemagne look like in real life uh he man basically but no with like way. longer hair um, oh yeah, Char Charlemagne's just he he's uh he's just based in in, in both in, in both politics and, and appearance. So yeah. Um it, it was kind of funny because like we were walking around and people were calling him based Jesus, which is you know heretical as all hell, but it was just funny. Mm. But uh yeah, I say we should try and organize a right yeah. art event. Shout out but not just in New York City, because I just I don't need it to be like this like transgressive politics is kink thing. I want it then, to then yeah, politics is queer culture, politics is kink. Yeah. Then the journalists will get involved. Yeah, then the then the journalists yeah. and Jannies will and keep in mind the New York Times already wants an online e right reporter beat guy. Yeah. So we'll do it in somewhere where it's not New York City. But yes, we should do it yeah um shout out to my friend atop the cliffs he's been a follower of mine for years i did uh he used some of my artwork he is a poet and uh he is a great poet and look him up uh atop the cliffs on twitter and telegram and he is one of the few um poets uh oh there you go we there have you another... go we have one more and see there you go uh Arsenius. yeah he says my, my loyal janny on there, telegram there you oh by go. the way i forget to shell Go to my Telegram, Giant Productions on Telegram. I never show that. I'm at 777 follow. I can't believe it's 777 followers. Well, uh, you're obligated to do a piece on Snorlax now. Um, yeah, man. But yeah. he says he will drop a big donation for you, Geo, on the next show. I want oh, the Andy wow. Worski dramatic style of delivery, too. So, yeah, um, man. You're, next you're week up. will probably be the film review if we get Catherine involved. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, next week we'll probably do two, three films, actually. We'll do um fatso and then uh pig hack that would be so heavy much fun. oh man heavy was like i watched it and i'm okay not to spill the beans but i'm sort of kind of always in that kind of situation um with e girls and uh it was like really oh my god it, it really it really bothered me man like you know when you watch a movie and it's like i remember one time my best friend in real life he made me watch with him uh 500 days of summer and that's my ultimate lit litmus test for women yeah what how explain this how so how so because oh, like yeah my, my, yeah my litmus test for for testing people uh, well, women especially if they've seen the movie is who do you side with at the end of that film do you do you side with joseph gordon levitt or do you side with zoe de chanel yeah yeah de chanel sorry um and what I'm, if they choose de chanel then they're probably getting well then i then flag. i know just not to mess with them and i move on 
Um, that that gives me a pretty good way of uh, gauging people's interpretations of relationships and what women do to men. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, that movie broke me, man. That movie broke me. (laughs) It's the ultimate sort of millennial era, you know, relationship movie about millennial relationships. Cause like, 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 she has to move on to the next relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like the the woman that I've always been in love with since we were little kids that I'm still friends with. Like I even like just tonight I was talking to her before we went online. Uh, like and it's we're two like fundamentally different people and it'll never work out. And I'm kind of like comfortable with that in the sense of like as much as like as much as I'm attracted to her and as much as I have this like weird like arrow of Cupid stuck into my heart since we were like literally little kids together. It's just like I know that there's too much barriers and there's too much, like we're just two totally different people and it would never work out. And like, she just like, I, you know what I mean? So in some ways I feel like as a man, you have to, um, especially if you're a creative type, I I feel like it's good to have sort of a muse in your life that you're not necessarily, even though it's not a relationship that you want, it's still something or it's still like a motivating force. And I think that's good. And I feel that like, you know, even though it's like, yeah, it sucks that I'll never be with her and we'll never get married to her, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, that's like, it's like, she's a type of person where it's like, she's not exactly marriage material, but like, um, she still has a very powerful, like magnetic force about her. And I feel like, you know, that's fine. That's like, again, like a muse, you know, like an artistic thing. And it's like, you know, it's not, you know, uh, yeah then you move on right like that's the thing like you have to i feel like the problem nowadays with a lot of men is we don't really have those great loves in our life anymore is that like a lot of like young men well i mean we do but we yeah yeah i'm not like i'm not talking about women i'm talking about in general like you know anything like i mean yeah like you know what i mean like i feel like men i I, I think it has a lot to do with I, i think the overly online part and who we choose to interact with. I mean, a lot of it is is a mindset thing, but I also think it also has to do a lot with maybe um, just who we reach out to or who we talk to, Um, because then there also comes with the, the the baggage of idealizing somebody over what they actually are. Um, So I, but I don't mean like just a person, like a relationship. I mean, like, something that motivates us and like, and oh, yeah. I know it was okay. like I see what you mean. Basic like Jordan Peterson point, but it's like, it is true. I feel like the, the sort of like the, okay. The only way a society can sustain, not sustain, but like the only way that a society can harbor most men having a great love or a great passion is that you have to have a sort of mythopoetics that are integral to that society. Yeah. And if you don't have that, if you have this sort of like international airport society, then it's like, that's not going to cut it. Like, I mean, America, I know that like, I, I like my inherent like sympathies towards like, well, what's the meme term? Your Asianism or whatever. Like, I know that my like sort of like, you know, America's the great state and America is like the root of all evil, but there's still like a part of America in my estimation that has a mythopoetic student. I even think like in Canada in some weird ways, an older version of Canada has that. And there's something that you have to cultivate. Like I, I remember like sorting out this piece of art that I wanted to do that was, uh, I was going to work with then on it. And uh, it was like, something about like a Russian soldier with a monk and it's on the Ural mountains. And I remember Matthew just said, Gio, why don't you just make something about Canada? Like, what do you got to like put this like ideological bullshit in your head about? Cause like you hate the government so much that you're willing to like, not create a mythopoetic about the place that you live in directly. And he's like, you know, leave that propaganda for the Russians. Like I go, yeah, you're right, man. Like, uh, like, and so I scrapped that idea and it's like, you know, you have to think about the place that you live in directly. It's like, if there is a, even on a localist level, if there is a sort of compelling mythos that can guide you into like appreciating where you live. I mean, like, well, this, like this, Des this pointed out in the back, chat, like, but this Zed goes Des back pointed to out. You. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, this goes back to you to what Dave had been really hammering about in his last few streams about folk culture and folk music. Um, yeah. I mean, for, for God's sakes, you have, the ability to channel you really could geo if you wanted to to embrace that 
and to you know have a mythopoetic narrative for for Canada or or whatever you want to view it as. I mean, I you Stan Rogers is the best example of what I think to be is the quint- quintessential folk Canadian. Yeah, and I mean yeah. that is the most Canadian thing I can think of. And I don't see why that couldn't be channeled or taken advantage of. Cause it's like, there is no supporter of, of like the, the, who has the blue and yellow country flag in their profile picture. That's Canadian. There's not a single person right now that is going to be singing, you know, the Northwest passage or Barrett's mm. privateers or the idiot. Right. You know, uh, th- that is something I think that could be reclaimed for those that are Canadian, but maybe don't like where you live with, you know, the Castro Castro's bastard son running it. I mean, <laughs> y- there, there's a lot that you could do with it. That's just my, that's my two cents on, on, on the issue. Yeah. But uh, Ge- okay. Geo is simping and has a scarcity mindset. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, to- <laughs> Geo has his motivation for equivalent to Taylor Swift's boyfriend. <laughs> oh god you people are vicious man um no it's i love it i love it. it's good it's it's true um there you know it's like my good friend your gay of the west i know people give him heat but he said that you know you can simp in such a divine way that you go back to a romantic erotic idea of lo- true love which i think is true um but zed des says geo is in ontario the definition of hell don't blame him for wanting to get out he should do a test run first, though. America ain't a walk in the park. Yeah, that's very true. America isn't a walk in the park, man. Um, but it's, you know, yeah. Um, I think that you, I'll send you this essay I did once on my before I had Word when I had WordPress about um, have you ever watched this uh back when uh the National Film Board did actual good quality Canadiana stuff? Uh you ever watch this film called Blake? You ever heard of this? No. It's about um this pilot who is like this bush pilot that does it for a hobby. And like, he talks about like escaping his like mundanity of like working in a big, like working in Toronto and like going on his plane and like falling asleep, um, like landing in a random field and falling asleep and then waking up. And like, it's, it's really good. I wrote an essay about um, a lot of like people that I knew in my life who are older Canadians who like traveled and like, were kind of like subaltern and sort of like, like like we're vagabonds more or less like yeah you know and and how canada bred those certain type of older generation to do that and how that's being lost and how like the modern canadian is like this i don't want a fed post but you know (laughs) you know what i mean like it's i I get it there's no longer that sort of anglo spirit of adventure and like people that literally could not live in and the reason i wrote this essay is because my tenant who I lived with for almost like a long time for like 15 years, he's one of these people. He traveled all over Canada and he like just can't fit in. And he wrote, he, he told me about this poem by this modernist poet called the, the men who don't fit in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I remember including it in, in the essay, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, and I really like, it really like summed up, I think not just in Canada, but also I think in America too, there were were this sort of like group of men, especially who traveled and who were hobos and who were vagrants. And they sort of, they, they sort of uh, created their own sense of what the landscape meant in terms of a, I would even say a spiritual journey is sort of like the way that a, a fakir in Islam or in a, a pilgrim of some sorts. Uh, and there's a lot of literature. There's a lot of like hobo literature about this as well. Um, but you, you were saying Josh Ham had something good. Oh, he was say. just talking about like hipsters, but um, yeah, 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 yeah no, hipster um, racism, <laughs> hipster racism. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely true there to a large degree. But th- here's the thing, though. I know, like a lot, of, like okay, without naming names again, without naming names, is that as much as we critique America, there is a subsection of the political right in America that like these people just genuinely hate America. They don't care. Like they don't like anything good that embodies like what America is, they just despise. And I feel like without naming names, I feel like there are people that that sort of discourse. I mean, as much as I'm terminally blackpilled about Canada, I realize that it's not healthy. It's not good. But if you're American, I feel like there, there's certain elements of America that to turn your back on because of your like, if that hipster racist politics is sort of like sad in a way. And I feel like that's, there's definitely something worth fighting for. And even if you feel that, you know, Oh, I'm European and I'm of European stock, which I am of European stock, but like, 
it's, you know, there's still something about this place that belongs to us as, as deeply racist and problematic and colonialist and settler as that sounds, there is something deeply, you know what I mean? Like there's something that, you know, you know what I mean? Prude. Like, yeah, it's just, yeah. I, I, I had a video about this yesterday. I'll, I'll shill it now to those yeah. who are here. Uh, I called it political paleontology and I got flack for it because people oh, are yeah, like, well, yeah, I get, yeah, yeah, I, get yeah. I get black pilled when I look at the past and I'm like, I, that motivates me because it's just like, this is what was taken from me. And this is what I should strive to create in this like current day and age, whether it's with my community or whatever. It's just, I look, it's like those old path, a archival footage videos of like the turn of the century, Europe or turn of the century, America, oh, yeah. or even 1930s and forties America. And I'm like, yeah, that stuff was taken and it's gone. And I know that it's gone and it's a part of the past. And as a paleontologist, I have to be very, very careful to not reconstruct it blindly or falsely in my own right, image or what right. I desire it to be. But I'm motivated by it because I have a deep love for what came before me. And I don't think that it should be thrown out the window, which is why I like, you know, um, I get asked all the time, well, why don't you just show us the raw audio? Because we want to hear nature or, or the wind or whatever. And I'm like, well, I really don't want you guys listening to me doing like folk songs or just, mm. you know, um, <laughs> or other <laughs> kind of music that I like. I, I don't need you all to hear. This is not Prude Sings Hour, right? This is me fishing for you all. I give commentary. But I mean, when I'm out there, it's like this is, it, it reminds me of just a very settler mindset. It reminds me of a, uh, of the manifest destiny of it all. Even if I'm just a man fishing at his pond, it's just that I love the fact that that is a part of the American psyche and the American experience. And the reason why I really hate so much of this like hipster racism, Oh, I really hate America. And I'm like, I don't care being like a bunch of pioneers that like conquered America and like fought Mormons and fought native American tribes against me while I'm trying to like carve out my own civilization is the most giga Chad based thing that I can think of. And I'm not going to let you fuckers take it from me. You know, who's cool. Magellan was way cooler than Justin <laughs> Bieber. He circumnavigated. <laughs> okay, so I have a funny, I have a, I, have a, I have a funny story about this. Um, so the current person that I'm, 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 I'm chatting with, uh, uh, has sort of this rejoinder about um, bio Leninism, yeah. and she's just like, "Well, why don't you just call it bio Magellanism?" <laughs> and I'm just like, I feel like this is, and I, I give her so much flack for it. Cause I'm just like, well, why don't you just call that? Like what white people do? Um, and she, there uh, was that term shit way people like Swipple. Yeah. Yeah. It, something uh, like that. Right. But yeah, she, she wants to call that bio Magellanism, just like people who can, uh, who are just biologically inclined to just like circumnavigate the globe, travel the world, you know, I'm conquer a, a land and do yeah. it. <laughs> and I'm like, so I, I, I have this as a Substack draft where like a bunch of writers on like the trust and safety team or like at the Atlantic want to, um, oh god, uh, try and counter spandrels bio Leninism with bio Magellanism, where they're just like, well, really, the immigrants that are coming here really have the bio Magellan spirit of wanting to carve out something for themselves in this new world. Um, but but, you know it's just uh, uh, just you said that you mentioned magellan and i just died laughing because yeah. that's that's what immediately came to that mind was, was her take on bio magellan why was the so, alex jones justin biebler rant I, it's yeah. such a good rant it's, it's yeah you know. yeah no but that's the thing like i mean th there is something i i noticed like it's becoming more apparent especially under the brandon administration that like there is something viscerally like there's something if you're like an original American or even if you're like an Irish or Italian immigrant, it's like there is something like inherently viscerally disgusting about saying that like this place isn't yours and like you should just move aside and like you're not the future and we're gonna like I'm not gonna say the R the R word ace you, but it's like Yeah. It, there is something viscerally disgusting about that attitude. It's like it's not happening but it's a good thing that it yeah, is the, like, the you know, that the celebration parallax. Yeah. 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 What well, Anton called it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what's the term that recently is it the, uh, it's not happening, but it's a good thing that it is. Is that the term or is it something yeah. else? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's not really happening, but it's a good thing that it is like that type of attitude is just so viscerally uh, disgusting. And I feel that like, but then at the same time, you have to, how am I not out. supposed to take that other than an open declaration of war? No, exactly. But then another side is like the the stark, brutal, blackpilling reality is that there a lot of huge swaths of people that are like, you know, of European stock agree with they, it. They agree with it, but they also have just like actively given it away. Like it's just 
what are you going to do? Like, this is the problem I feel. And I feel like a lot of uh, people of the more like white identity persuasion, they don't have, um, th some of them have an answer, but like, I feel it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't want a black pill. I don't want a black pill, but like, yeah, I, I can't yeah. do that. My, like I've said before on this channel and I've said elsewhere, my goal is to simply, um, you know, plant the vine and fig tree. My children will sit under and not be afraid, even if I don't live to see it. Um, yeah. that, that, that's my, that's my goal, whether I make it or not, that's the plan. Um, but okay. Uh, I, I, I do not want to be, uh, accomplishing a, a territory of having the four hour stream. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, next week it will be on geo's channel. All yes. of these, um, videos that we do, whether it's on geo's or mine is on the playlist that I have created. Um, you can go to the channel, uh, my channel, go to playlists. You'll see the digital archipelago. We'll add every episode there. So do not worry. Um, and, uh, Gio, do you have anything that you would like to shill and or announce? Uh, yeah. Um, I'll eventually upload all of them to my Odyssey and probably Anchor. Um, but other than that, yeah. So tomorrow is the second installment of Style Talks number eight. The second part where we actually get into analyzing the songs and the concept behind the album Obsleep by Fear Factory. Um, I don't know. I probably will do something. I don't know if I'll do something in the weekend, another stream. Uh, but next week I will drop the Helena and default friend uh, power hour content minded. Oh, sorry. Ladies hour content minded. And uh, it's amazing. It'll be great. I also, Oh, no, another thing I have to show is um, I have two parts of it already done, but I am starting what I call giant art reviews that are Patreon exclusives and I am reviewing the whole book of Byung Chil Han's Psychopolitics on Patreon. So go to patreon.com slash Janet Productions. You can search it now because I DM'd a Janny on uh, Patreon and they said that as long as I'm not making any like explicit images public, that it's mostly audio, that uh, my channel is now um, safe for work. So you can like search it in Apple and you could search the app and you could search it in uh, patreon.com. So yeah, go to patreon.com slash general productions and you can, I, the third part of Byung Chil Han. So I have the first two parts. I do the very first chapter called the crisis of freedom. That's how it's not a big chapter, but it's like meaningful. And then the second part, I do the last part of uh, crisis of freedom. And I also do what he calls smart power, the chapter called smart power. So next week, this week coming up this Sunday or Monday, I'm doing uh, the chapters, The Mole and the Snake, um, Foucault's Dilemma, and Biopolitics. So, and probably maybe another one because they're short. So, yeah, go. And I'll, I'll probably do other articles and other Patreon exclusive book reviews. Yeah. I want to do a series of going through each chapter of the Red Book, but that'll probably be like a year from now. I have to do like a, I'll have to do like a ton of research on that. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Uh, Geo's links are all down below in the description. Uh, as, as for me, um, of course, the Sunday, Praise of Folly and I will be discussing a lot of Kennan's writings. We'll be finishing up my uh, George F. Kennan series of Sunday streams. Tomorrow, we will have my review of Elvis 2022. Um, so that'll be on Substack. And also for the patrons, you will get uh, two uh, exclusive uh, article reviews. I call them flipping through foreign affairs. So I take foreign affairs magazine articles, foreign policy and other international relations news sources. We read them and I give you my live reaction and my analysis takes on them in a recorded video. So uh, those are always going to happen every week on Subscribestar down below in the link in the description. All of that stuff, make sure that, you know, uh, my over my uh, transplant medication and things like that are very affordable. You guys have been so fantastic. And then this Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern, I will be joined by Jeremy Carl of the Claremont Institute to discuss his article Beyond Ho Elves and Hobbits, his response to Curtis Yarvin's issue on the culture war. So a lot has been in store for you guys. I will probably also do a community post with all my other outside YouTube appearances that I've done on other channels. So again, yeah, support Geo, support me. Stack. And um, also, um, 
will be next week on Geo's channel. Hopefully we'll have Default Friend on. We're yeah. going to have a lot of fun movies for you all to enjoy. Oh, yeah. So, I want to do actually a Substack post where it's just like to put in my link tree of like all the different appearances I've done. Yeah, like, we, that's what Curtis Yarvin does. I think I need to do the same. Yeah, ZHP does that as well. Yeah, yeah. You know what's funny is that he did the one where he was debating BAP. Not, not debating BAP, but he was debating like the idea. He was like pro BAP. And he's like some pothead dork on Breakthrough Rules. <laughs> I'm like, bro, like I like, like Aeon, like he's a friend of mine, but it was like, <laughs> just the way ZHP goes after people, it's hilarious. <laughs> but um, no, I, like, yeah, Aeon's a great dude. Um, No, but uh, yeah, I have to do that. But anyways, um, you know we, what we, we should do? Yeah, we have things to do, right? Um... Yeah, no, but you know what article <laughs> you should do for your subscribe star? How, what do you call them? You don't call them patrons. You, you just Oh, call I, them... I do. I just say patrons. I mean, that's what yeah. they are, is that you are supporting the work that I do. You are a patron. I am beholden to you. Yeah, but does subscribe star have their own, like, you are my stars or some stupid? I don't know, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just say I just say patrons or backers. Yeah, patrons. Backers, there you go. Um, yeah. You know what you should do? The article from the Royal Military Society that you know the one i'm talking about the um the what's it called the uh the re was it called the rebirth of mechanical warfare or like the uh industrial warfare or like the you know the one th that uh that alexander mccoy covered you should do that one i'll send it to you because i wanted to i was curious to see your take on it um you know the one i'm talking about prude yeah i do i i, I i'll send me the link though and i'll uh i'll, I'll definitely review it yeah, man, I think you should do that one. I think it's up your alley because like it really like I think it and you know, have to realize that this comes from like the think tank of the British Royal Military. And it's like that that's like the word of authority. Right. You know. Yeah. It's, and so the fact that they're saying that the sort of nationalization of industry as opposed to like this American like, you know, post industrial corporate model of warfare is like that's what really is going to win the wars of the future and, and create like a multipolar. Well, I mean, yeah, world. we've definitely seen that out after the uh, Chinese delicacy that just basically, yeah. um, that, uh, over the, the, the convenience of our international supply lines does not make for national resilience. Yeah. So, um, with the four hour, uh, Mark, uh, approacheth soon. And yeah, I we better cut to, it off right now. We better cut it off before that happens. I'm going to have to already upload this manually to Odyssey anyways, but all right, we'll be over next week on, uh, Geo's channel. Thank you all so much for tuning in and do let us know if you're on Twitter, how this went for, for the, the Twitter live stream part of it all. And, uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. You guys have been fantastic and we look forward to seeing you all next week see you god then. bless goodbye too sweet